Welcome back to the Comic Book Historians Podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Bob Hall, who has a, an interesting and very fun career in penciling, inking, editing, and writing comic books. Bob Hall, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. All right, so we're going to hopscotch through your life. This is your life, Bob Hall. Um, oh, Jim's going to start in your early years. Go ahead and take it away. You were born in uh, fall 1944, in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, which is definitely your your home home place uh, amongst all your travels, correct? Yes. And let's. I always like to ask a little bit about family. I know um, you you come from a, a blue collar background. Um, tell me about your mom and your dad. Well, my um, mom and my dad were uh, supers of an apartment building where we lived until I was about uh, six and a half years old. Um, then we moved right across the street from it so my dad could continue that work. And, uh, uh, and my mother worked with him, although she didn't get paid, of course. Uh, that was, this was the late 40s, early 50s, and uh, she was just supposed to help him. And, uh, but he had, um, he had had that job. He got, it through, got him through the Depression. They were both older, which I never figured out until uh, Oh, about 1997, I found out that I was adopted. And uh, uh, so I have no idea who my birth parents were, but these, these guys were my mom and dad. They were great people. Oh, that's interesting. Um, at age four, and this is a common uh, trope with a lot of uh, comic book uh, creators and such, but at age four, you uh, had some to put you in the hospital. Uh, in your case, it was intestinal measles. Is that right? That's right. They didn't know what was wrong with me. So uh, uh, they put me in a private room because they didn't know what was wrong with me, which was good. And they uh, tried to pacify me because I didn't feel that terrible after the first day. I was apparently vomiting blood. That was my folks was, uh, were very, of course, very worried. And uh, they stuck me in this private room. And to pacify me, they kept bringing me comic books. And uh, I couldn't read yet. Uh, but uh, I ended up accumulating a huge stack of them. And then uh, they were actually going to do an exploratory on me. And they were about to wheel me out. And the nurse noticed me itching behind my, scratching behind my right ear. And she looked and some of the measles had appeared. And she said, oh my God, you've got measles. We have to, and called the doctor and they see, he confirmed it and said, we have to get you out of here out of the children's ward right now, measles being uh, one of the most contagious diseases going, and you have to take all those comic books with you. And so I ended up with this stack of, oh, if I had those today, but be that as it may. And those, that would have been your introduction to Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge, which became probably, one of your favorites? It probably wasn't my introduction to Carl Barks. I, I think my folks had bought me uh, some of those with the, the Dell comics seemed to be wholesome. So they bought those. And uh, it was my introduction to unwholesome comics. And I don't remember exactly what they were. I presume there were some Kirby in there. And uh, um, that would have been the, I don't know if EC was still was in operation by that point. I'm not a good enough comic historian, but some of the, some of, some of the second tier uh, superheroes and uh, uh, of course, some Superman, Batman and that kind of stuff, some DC comics as well. So it was my introduction to the more adult kind of comic book. When and I was, was doing the timeline, it, it looked to me like you were you were uh, you you dropped out of comics in your early teens at the latest, which is around the time that EC would have been right in there. So if yeah, you got yeah. so I think you might have missed that. I missed. Um, I don't think I quite missed EC because I think I got the the. the beginnings of EC. I remember, for some reason, uh, Atlas Comics horrors more than I remember um, reading a bunch of, uh, of the EC. But I had no idea of the EC ethos at that time. You know, I was just a kid. Yeah. And uh, Atlas, I probably read whatever was available to me on the spin rack. Uh, I learned about uh, Tainted Meat from EC Comics, so. <laughs> I can believe that, yes. So I read a story, an interview where you mentioned something about 
a Sunday school teacher. Uh, I think her name was Evelyn. Mm -hmm. You've got a good memory. Yeah. Tell, tell me about that. Oh, oh, well, well, I was, I was sent to church and um, the, uh, my folks were not churchgoers, but they felt, you know, uh, I think they felt a great deal of responsibility as adoptive parents when I looked back that I should have a normal childhood in spite of the fact that they were uh, both over 40. And so uh, I was sent to church. Well, the church was right across the street from where we lived. So that was convenient and, and it felt safe. They could just send me across the street. And um, it was called the Citywide Gospel Tabernacle. And it was, uh, I, I guess it, it, they considered themselves evangelists, although it wasn't evangelist in the uh, current sense of it. Uh, it was evangelist in the, the Billy Graham sort of evangelism, which is a more, a more progressive sort, I guess. Um, it certainly seemed kind of benign, although I was never managed to get sick as a kid and I kept going all the time. Uh, I, I remember my first taste of cognitive dissonance was when, of course, I found out immediately that everybody was going to hell unless they, you know, accepted Jesus. And, and uh, I began to pray incessantly for all my friends and relatives and my folks. And my, my, my dad one day called me praying and he said, what are you doing? And, and I said, pray. And he said, oh, well, that, that's, that's okay. What are you praying for? I said, well, everybody's going to hell and you're going to hell. I don't know if you're saved. And, I don't know. What he, and he took a deep breath and he said, look, you have to go to church because your mom wants you to go, but don't take it too much to heart. And that was total, like, holy moly. <laughs> then what is it? What does life mean then? Uh, and I, I, Kept trying to sort that out for a long time and and some somewhere when i was about 10 or so i uh i think i began to realize that i was basically an agnostic but i, I still had to keep going to church and um I'm, I'm not getting to evelyn but church church was um great because uh, in, in some ways because uh we had to memorize all these bible verses from the king james bible and uh, I found that by the time I was in high school, I understood Shakespeare because it's the same, the same lingo. And so that's been my other career as, as a Shakespearean director. So that's a whole nother story. Evelyn, I was in love with, and she was a, a, an early crush of mine. She was these, um, the Sunday school teacher and then the, the minister's maiden daughter who never married and, and stayed, she was a church lady. And she uh, did what was in essence comics on a flannel board. She had these characters and she would, tell these stories and put these figures up on the flannel board and make them walk across and do all this stuff. So she was a great storyteller. And uh, that part of it uh, uh, was, was, I think, influential. And in, in, she was doing comic books. She just didn't know she was doing comic books. So. Oh, that's great. I, I, I like that story when I, I read it and I wanted to ask you about that. So the, the combination of all the Bible verses and, and some of this other pointed you and the interest in Shakespeare, I assume at an early age, pointed you toward um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln and studying theater? I loved comic books when I was a kid, absolutely adored them and had a ton of them, which again, wish I had now, but never mind. My folks got rid of most of them when I, when I ended up going to college. And uh, when they just sort of disappeared and that was okay. That was what was supposed to, seemed what was supposed to happen. They tore, my mother tore up a lot during the, the Frederick Wortham. Uh, oh no. The Dr. Wortham days. Anything that had like Wonder Woman or a scantily clad woman on the cover. So they went to ECs, they went Wonder Woman. Um, and uh, um, so I had, um, stopped reading comic books mostly by the time I was 12. I just, I was just gotten in on the DC relaunch of their, their second tier heroes. Uh, uh, I remember the first, I had the first flash issue. Um, and uh, that those, that's the one I remember the first, the first few flashes and uh, at some point in there, but the idea, the idea of course, at that time was that you, where it was expected by the comic companies that get kids would stop reading them at a certain point. 
Yeah, in fact, you know, DC recycled so many of their stories and would have them redrawn uh, because you assume that, that nobody was going to, to to read them twice. You know, there, there was it was a limited and I, a, a time frame, and I, and I did. I, I I became much more interested in theaters and theater and horror movies. Hammer films had a great influence on me. Hammer films and Shakespeare, and um, so when I got to high school. Uh, we they would do these speech contests, and I picked uh, did did one of them in my uh, did Shakespeare and and my teacher um, thought I was pretty good. Actually, I was kind of disappointed. I didn't get the highest grade. She said, "Maybe you should listen to it yourself." So I listened to a tape recorder and found that I had sounded like this. I had a Sylvester Pussycat lisp, uh, which kids will have and they don't know they have it you, you don't think you don't hear it the same way on the inside so I had to lose that but then I I, I became I had never been I'd always been a shy kid and I, I could never quite find my place in the universe which was usually in my basement reading comic books and this was the first time I had found something that was a social activity that uh, got me out of the house and got me working with other kids and I really uh, kind of was being pretty successful as an in, in college as a and and high school as an as an actor and later as a as a director, and because I could draw, I also did a lot of scenery design. So, it it was it was a whole new world for me. And and so you you got your um, your bachelor's um, in 1967, and then went on and got your master's. Um, in 1969, uh, both at University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Is that right? Right. Now, I saw some reference to University of Iowa. Was that a mistake or did you do something? There? I went to the University of Iowa for one year and the bet had some good experiences. The best experience was that I became friends with, uh, close friends with Nicholas Meyer, who uh, Oh, uh, the 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 uh, director now he's the director seven percent solution and all the the Star Trek films and I've still but still been in touch keep in, I've kept in touch with him all this time and he was he was going to the University of Iowa as well that was the best thing about the University of Iowa but uh, and I was uh, I don't know my career would have taken a whole different tack but I was um, it was it was the Vietnam era the draft had not ended and I was uh, classified as 1A and which meant that you were going to go and it was and that was at the end of my first year in, at the University of Iowa and so I they were starting a summer theater at the University of Nebraska and they asked me to come back and direct and I did that gladly because I kind of wanted to be at home I wanted to figure out what I was going to do and I was also scared shitless because I had terrible uh foot problems, I still do. Uh, my, my, my feet were, I had high arches, extremely high arches. And I didn't realize that when you went through a physical, the only thing that automatically kept you out was flat feet. And um, a guy at the University of Nebraska, so I'm back at the University of Nebraska and this, this guy named Jim Bafico, who was interesting fellow, he, he was, studying acting at the University of Nebraska on the off season and playing for the Buffalo Bills in the on season. And uh, so he, and he had started as a football player at the University of Nebraska and found out the, he realized he was never going to be a great football player, but he was huge and he could, he could, he was offered a contract with the Buffalo Bills. So we decided to go. So he carried some, some weight in, in more ways than one. And he said, well, what, what are you doing back here? What's, what's going to happen? What, what, are you, what are you up to? And I said, well, I, I think I'm going to get drafted. I don't know. He said, they can't draft you. I've worked with you for several years now. You have terrible feet. And I said, well, yeah, but they, they classified me 1A. And he said, wrote down the name of a doctor. He said, go to this doctor. And so I went to the doctor and it, it, the, the, it, a um, orthopedics guy, and he looked at my feet and he wrote this letter to the draft board. It was one of the snottiest letters I've ever heard said, you could draft Mr. Hull, but um, he uh, would have to have three different pairs of orthopedic shoes, one for uh, normal wear, one for standing of attention, and one for combat. And he would have to change them constantly. So 
do as you want, do what you want. And I was afraid to give this to the draft board and I handed it to the draft board guy who had made an appointment. You can request another physical. I handed it to the officer who was in charge and he looked at it and he said, okay. And I was of course standing there in my underwear with no shoes on. He said, put one foot up on my desk. And I put the foot up and he looked at it and he said, leave it there and put the other foot up. And I, he, I paused a moment and then he started to laugh and said, nah, you're out. And, and of course I realized then that all these guys knew each other. This, 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 this guy was friends with the orthopedics guy. And, and so I was not drafted, but by that time it was too late to go back to the University of Iowa. So I was, and I was kind of disgusted. I just wanted to get to New York at that point and uh, pursue a career in directing. So I uh, opted for getting a master's degree at the University of Nebraska, which I could finish in one year and just get on with life. That, that explains a lot because I, I was trying to figure out the Iowa thing and that, that helps a lot. Just uh, to go back to Nicholas Meyer just for a minute, I just want to say I was I read 7% Solution before he ever started in, in film and it was a, a real favorite of mine. Um, and also he did uh, he did Time After Time. Alex, mm -hmm. have you ever seen that? Sure. I have oh, not. I, I have not seen that. Oh, it's a I, great I, film. H.G. Wells, Time Travel uh, oh. with Jack the Ripper. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah. Oh, Malcolm McDowell. It, it's it plays well. It's fantastic. Yeah, he's he's got uh, a number of new Holmes books. Every time he's not in, engaged in movie work, he uh, he writes a new Holmes novel. And uh, and Sherlock Holmes and the peculiar po the peculiar protocols is the latest one, and I highly recommend it. Oh, uh, I will I will look for that because I haven't about, read those since the the first one. Yeah. So yeah. Oh yes. He has. He has several. So look him. Look him up. They're all. They're all great fun. Nick. Nick was the had one of the most peculiar careers. He, when I talk about careers, um, I think. I think he would probably deny this, but I think Nicholas was just sort of raised by parents who made him feel that he was successful. He was. He was already a successful human being when I met him, and I was saying, "What do I have to do to be a success?" Nick was wondering what he had to do to pursue a career because he felt very, con he was a very confident person, uh, seemingly. Now, maybe I don't know what he was on the inside, but he, uh, he outlined that what he intended to try to do was write a best-selling book, and then he would be hired to write the screenplay. He would insist on writing the screenplay, <laughs> and that would be his entree into movies. And he did it. He did exactly what he said. That's so amazing, because that never worked. That just, just astonishing, yeah. All right, so you, when you're back at, at school, you're trying to finance a move to New York through uh, one thing that you're doing to raise, save money is you're doing a lot of uh, posters for the theater department and for the Nebraska Union, is that right? I did that and well, actually that was my, uh, that was what put me through undergrad. As a grad student, you got an assistantship and I was building props. I was very good at building stage props. And uh, so I did, I did that. And then they hired me again to direct in their summer program. And then for two years, I ran a children's theater in Omaha that needed a, a new, they were looking for a director. And uh, so that was a job job and I can actually save some money, which <laughs> at that time, if, if you were moving to New York, you thought, oh, if I can just have $1,000 in the bank, I, I'll be okay, which is, of course, insane now. You could no more move to New York for 1000 bucks than God only knows. But, but you, could, you could in the year. This would have been um, 1971 when I finally, finally made the move. Now, did you have anything lined up? I know you, you became resident director at uh, this uh, CSC uh, repertory and you had other uh, things with the George Street Playhouse and, and, and various jobs there, but were any of those um, already, to, uh, you know, on your radar yeah. when you left? No? No, yeah, I had nothing. I had nothing. All I had was friends in New York that I could, we could stay with until we could um, get an apartment. I had a, a wife, my first wife, who was willing to get a job she was dying to live in New York, thank God, and she and she was um, uh, much more employable than 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 I was because she's smarter than I am, and uh, I 
had um, been trying to figure out, I, I, would, I visited New York and realized that if you wanted to be a theater director or an artist or, or, or anything in the arts in New York, that unless you were wealthy um, or had a job lined up or had a ton of, of highly successful contacts, you needed some kind of marketable skill. And a friend of mine uh, who was a comic book fan, and I had started reading comic books again a little bit. I was very fond of the Warren comics. And I, you know, I picked one up in the magazine section and flipped through and the, the art was so wonderful that I would occasionally buy Warren's. But uh, were those the friend, early? Those were what in the the early years, um, like when Archie Goodwin was the editor, and people like Alex Toth and Steve Ditko were doing it, or was it later? It was just a little bit later, uh, just a little bit later. I think Archie was still working for them, but the uh, it was the time when, um, well, occasionally Neil would be doing something, but. Uh, um, God, now, now, now I'm, I'm blank on, on the names of the people that I really loved. Uh, um, Ernie Cologne, Cologne was doing work for them. And uh, uh, I remember liking Ernie's, Ernie's work because it was different. Um, yeah. And uh, so it would, been, it would have been about that era. It would have been 1969, 70, right in there. And uh, my next thing was my friend, this actor friend of mine, Bill Shemansky, loved comic books. And he said, well, why don't you, you've, you've always drawn, you can draw, why don't you consider doing comic books? And I remembered some of those comic books I got that I still had from the, uh, um, when I was sick, I think I still had, had, probably had those until I was 11 or 12 years old and tons of other comics that I had that I had bought. There was a Salvation Army store near where I grew up where you could buy comics for two cents a piece. And you could come home with with shopping bags full of them, and I, I, I shudder to think what those comics would be worth because they were a lot of the comics that they had were very pristine looking ones from the 1940s, um, and I remembered there were wonderful artists, but there were also some pretty lousy artists, especially in the 1940s and early 50s ones, and I thought, well, I can be lousy. I mean, I could. I thought I could kind of at least fit in. And, and so he gave me some stuff to look at. Well, what he gave me was uh, Barry Smith was doing Conan. That was, those were the first ones he gave me. So my introduction <laughs> was Barry Smith. And then, I, and then I started going to the newsstand and uh, Jack had just left Marvel um, or was about to leave Marvel, I'm not sure, but, but he was in his prime uh, uh, Bernie Wrightson was was doing work for DC and also for Warren. Uh, Joe Kubert was doing uh, uh, some of his war stuff, but I think he I think he had just started doing Tarzan. Yeah, I know that would Neil, have been about right. I know Neil was doing uh, Batman and Green Lantern, and also the Avengers had just started his run on the Avengers. Somewhere in there, he had just started his run. He started his run on the Avengers. But uh, uh, in other words, Bill showed me the best people. And I said, I can't do this. I'm not good enough to do this. But I really wanted to. So I thought, this, this incorporates everything that I've done all my life, uh, the, the storytelling, the uh, art. And because you had both Roy and stan quoting shakespeare all the time and that didn't hurt either so it it, it it felt like something that i could do so i was crazy enough to think think okay well that will be my marketable skill uh, i'll break into the comic book industry and and actually i did <laughs> now is that what led you to go to the to um uh, go to the school of comics art of uh, john buschema um john uh, no, uh, it, it eventually, but I got to the point where I said was submitting uh, portfolios and getting rejected and uh, had just learning on my own, copying a lot of work, 
Um, and I could actually produce something that wasn't bad if it was like a single illustration and I spent a week on it. <laughs> but I got, you know, I got good enough that Charlton uh, hired me to do some of their horror, horror comics. And don't ask me which ones because they all had, were something like Dr. Creeper's House of Slimy Things. You know, they were these strange titles that Charlton have and I, I really don't remember that <laughs> oh, well. I, what I can, are, what I can tell I you the, the, the two that I saw that you, that you drew, not covers, but actual inside, um, was the werewolf's ghost uh, that was in Baron Werewolf's Haunted Library. See and, that I mean. was, and that was with uh, 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 Nicola Cuddy. Mm -hmm. And you did one called He Worshiped Beauty um, in no, the Many the Ghosts of Dr. Graves. And that was that written was the, by Joe Gill. That was the first one that I did, was, was the He Worshiped Beauty. And I may have done one more, or I may just have done a, a few covers for them. Because shortly after I got the job and you got and remember I was doing theater all the time I, I I I really was breaking into the theater business um Passion of Dracula was about to it was you were working on that it that was uh that started in 70 was it 76 that it, it it was it started running on off Broadway I think it was 70 was it 76 or 77 I don't yeah it might have been 76 it was um what year did I become an editor? Oh, that was seventy-eight. It may have been a. It may have been seventy-seven, uh, because um, they're connected. So I wasn't working, but no, I wasn't not working on that yet. I um, uh, at, at about the time that I got accepted by Charlton. Shortly thereafter, John put his an ad in the back of Marvel Comics that he was going to start teaching this class. And uh, he, uh, you, had to, you had to bring him a portfolio and you had to be living in the New York area and you, and you had to bring in a portfolio. And, so you know, so that, a, that class was in 1976 then, probably around the time when he did the Charlton cover. Just the Charlton. Yeah, yeah, so that was 75, I think was, was the class. Okay, um, so then probably when you made those, when you when the when the Charlton books are coming, but you may have done them in seventy five time. Yeah, time I think I, I, th I think I think John's was seventy five, seventy six. Uh, the the class it started. In, it, it it was really a full. He admitted that he that he had act, actually given it too many weeks eventually, but he had he, he met except for holidays. You you met every week for the the year for, for the school year. What, what, you know, like a school year. And so it started in the fall and went through the spring. And uh, I got in the class, I got accepted. And it turned out that I was the most experienced person in the class. Uh, it was the beginning of fandom. Well, not the beginning, but the beginning of the point where fans were trying to break, seriously breaking into the market that just about everybody if you think about it, after that point, who broke into the market, instead of being people who wanted to be doing newspaper strips back in the 40s and were wanting to get into commercial art in the 40s and 50s, uh, and that that now they may have changed and decided, no, my career is in comics, but but their initial impulse was usually not comic books. Um, and that all changed in the early 70s. By that time, there were fans that were devoted fans that wanted to be comic book artists. And they were fans of John's. And almost everybody who broke in was, was a fan, some very talented people, but they had not had anywhere near the amount of art experience that I'd had. And so after the class was over, John wanted, I think, somebody from that class. And I'm not saying that I was all that good, but... I was the one in the class that had had some background and, and John wanted somebody in that class to get a job at Marvel, I think. And, or maybe I'm being too humble. Maybe he really said, you're ready to go to, to Marvel, but I kind of think maybe a little of both, but yeah. But he, but he, uh, he got me the job at Marvel. And without that, I don't know if I ever would have, I, I, I suppose eventually I would have, but, but he, he, he helped me on the way. 
That's that's great. Now, so at the same time that you're taking that class, that's when you're you're writing with David Richmond the the Dracula play, which which does start in September 1977. So that's yeah. that's that's right timeline wise. Yeah, we had um, the, the the George Street Playhouse was a um, regional theater that started in, in it was a commute from New York. It started in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And the Eric Krebs, who ran it, wanted to have a Dracula. And I looked at the Dracula scripts and said, there's not, there aren't any good scripts. And he said, well, why don't you write one? And I had written, I think, a, a, yeah, I had adapted a children's play, but that, that was the extent of my writing. And so I felt, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. And worked on it for a while, but what, it wasn't ready to go by the time we needed to do it. So we picked one of these other ones and I kind of cut it and rewrote it. I can't remember what it was called. It was, it was not, it was the, not the, the Balderson Dean is the original Dracula and it's what the Bela Lugosi movie is based on. And that was the standard script and it, it, it creaked a lot. It, it was pretty creaky. I thought, well, everybody, you know, it, it was all based on nobody knows what a vampire is. And, you know, you're dealing with a time when everybody knew some of the things about what Dracula supposedly was. And so you, you, you I think I required a different script. And, and, and the one that we did was, was campy and I took some of the camp out of it and it, it was okay. It was well directed and well acted, but we had, the theater wasn't very rich and we had to fly a bat and it's a, in a proscenium theater, that's pretty easy, but this was a three quarter round theater and we kept trying to find a way to do it. And um, David Richmond was a wonderfully, a wonderful guy, very bright and uh, a, a career alcoholic uh, who, um, my stage manager, he played the butler in, in this version of Dracula. And my stage manager, a uh, woman named Lois said, you, 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 you want to cast this guy, actor David Richmond. And he came and auditioned. And I said, well, he's okay, but I, I think some other actors, she said, no, you want to cast him. And I said, why? And she said, he's been sleeping on my couch for two weeks. And if you cast him, he'll have enough money that I can get him, I can throw him out. <laughs> and I said, okay, so I cast him. And so we were trying to do, figure out a way to do this bad. And we had things, we had no money. So we were, had a plastic, one of these plastic wind up things that, 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 that uh, you know, flapped their wings. And we tried running that across, painting it black and running that across a, a line. And it, it, all it did was go around the wire uh, in a circle and then finally broke, broke the wire and was flapping at my feet. And every time we'd try something new, this guy, David Richmond would come up and say, I, I think I know how to do a bat. And I would usually say, yeah, 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 I'll talk to you later sometime. And finally, when it was, this thing was flapping at my feet, I said, okay, you tell me how you want to do a bat. And it, and it turned out that David had toured with a magician called Dr. Silkini, who did what they called spook shows. And if you don't know anything about spook shows, you guys ought to read up on spook shows because they're somehow they relate to comics a little bit. They've got these itinerant ma magicians would travel around the country uh, rent four walling a movie theater for a usually a midnight show and they would do a magic they would show pirated prints of, of Dracula and Frankenstein and then do a magic show which basically amounted to turn out turning out the lights and making spooks fly around and you got to you got to clutch your date. And David had toured with this guy. And so he knew what evolved, what it evolved into was we built an origami bat out of sc screen wire, painted it with luminous paint, did if you had the timing just right, you could actually make it look like Dracula disappeared. And all of a sudden there was a luminous bat flying around and buzzing the audience, which was really a kid with a spook pole shaking it in your face, but you'd been blinded by flash pots and all you could see was the bat. And it was so good that Clive Barnes from the New York Times, Eric got him out to see the theater. And he said, he, he said, well, it's 
the play isn't that good, but the but just the most sensational special effect I've ever seen. And on the basis of that, Eric said, I'll produce this show if you and David write it. And so we wrote it. And it turned out to be a hit and it was helpful that we had no idea that the this Balderston Dean version had been optioned and was going to be done on Broadway with Frank Langella. And that I was, was thinking announced. that time wise that that was right around the same time. It That's was, it was enough. We had thought we were safe because that particular version had been optioned to be made into a musical. And it kept getting announced in variety with different people. It would be announced that Ricardo Montalban was going to play the lead. And then six months later, it would be announced again. And Haley Mills was going to play the ingenue, but Ricardo Montalban was nowhere in the list. Usually what that meant was that, that, that it was out of gas. They weren't able to really commit to these people. And they were, they were scrambling, trying to raise money. And, and it, if you'd been around the theater a little bit, you knew that that meant this is never going to happen. So we thought, and so they let the option expire. We didn't know that these people were waiting with production for that option to expire. And they were going to bring it into Broadway with uh, the Edward Gorey sets and, and, and the whole thing. We said, we got to get ours on first. This is our only hope. Otherwise, we're going to look like we're just imitation. So we, we did. We had a remarkable cast and the play got reviews as good or better. Everybody reviewed the sets for the Uptown one and Langella's performance, but uh, we, got, we got reviews as uh, the people, the reviewers liked the play and they liked our cast and we, we ran for two solid years with it, uh, which is pretty darn good for, for Off-Broadway. And your, uh, your lead, Chris Burnell, he came from Dark Shadows? Yeah, he had been in Dark Shadows. Um, he was a, um, and he was, he was known for uh, soap operas. Yeah, so that, that soap opera, I think some other ones. Um, he had a certain following. It was, he wasn't a huge star, but, it, but he helped us. It, it, that his presence helped raise some money. He was a lovely man, uh, really was a fine Dracula. Uh, poor guy died of AIDS when in the AIDS, AIDS epidemic where he died way too young. Um, the other thing about that, that <coughs> to get back to comics that happened was that um, uh, Marv Wolfman and, and Gene both came to the play and there is a, a issue of Dracula where Dracula comes to see our play. Oh, wow. that's awesome. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And uh, I'll... Uh, I, I, I can't think which what the, what the I'm no I'm no good with those numbers. I'll uh, uh, I'll I'll send you a scan of it actually. Of yes, the, please. Of the cover. I'd love to see but that. That's but, so but, cool. But the, but the cover is is the real Dracula throttling our stage Dracula. Uh, yeah, I, I remember reading that because I read that run not too long ago. That's that's crazy that that was yours. Uh, so yeah, that, later in the later part of the run, yeah. And that's I was, really I was cool. In, I was insane at the time not to ask Gene for the for the pages. I'm sure he, I think he would probably have given them to me, and I don't I don't know why, where they are now, and I probably couldn't afford to buy them if I did know. But I would love to have them. Now, <clears throat> this I, my only last question on the on the Dracula production is that Showtime actually filmed it as part of their uh, Broadway on on Showtime thing that they were doing at the time. Is that do you know if that's available? in any format that we could watch it? Well, I have it. If I, if I can find it, uh, I, I, I have it on disc. Uh, it's really awful. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just terrible. Um, I'm they, sure that adds to the charm though. They, they had no idea. First of all, it was of the theater. It was a theater piece. And they were originally going to do it as a theater piece. They were going to get an audience in and do it live and that's sort of the standard now if, if you're doing these things like uh, uh, live from uh, uh, the National Theatre in, in, in London and the RSC, the Royal Shakespeare Company, they all have series where they, where they stream things and you, sure. and you watch it live and they, they do all the camera work and it, they do it extremely well but 
this was the first time anybody had suggested doing that. Uh, and live, live television was a lost art. It was uh, no longer <clears throat> being done much and, uh, at all. And so they chickened out and they did it uh, soap. And so doing something soap means that you're using a two camera setup. And it felt like a soap opera, um, meaning that the, the pace, the pace is slow. And we had a wonderful couple of wonderful actors playing Van Helsing and they, they wanted a more of a name and they got somebody that I think he, I don't remember what he had been on. I, I can't, I've, I've blocked his name because he was, again, he was just not right. And so it, none of it, it just didn't. And then that, then the special effect had no meaning in, in, in the, on a, on a soap type production, which means that it felt like a TV show minus or a movie less uh, the special effects had no meaning whatsoever because you could, you know, you could do them. Uh, you know, they, they were magic tricks. They were amazing because they were happening right in front of your eyes. Right. And the minute you had the chance to cut away or, 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 or do them as media, it had to be done a different way and they never could figure out why. So they were, it was awful, but I'll try to get you. I'll try to get you oh, a copy Please, of it. I would love to see that just for the fun of it. Sure. Um, I only have a couple of cleanup questions in terms of the Charlton stuff and the early stuff. And then Alex is going to take you through Marvel. Um, yeah, I, by, by, the, by the way, I'm, I'm, as, as you can hear, I'm perfectly capable of holding forth. And since this was going to be edited, I'm just like blabbering. So if that's okay, I'll just keep doing it. No, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously we're digging into a lot of stuff. So, yeah, you know, yeah. we're, we want to do a thorough job. Um, in in the GCD, they they credit you with uh, a Marvel cover, um, our love story number thirty six. Before you do any of the other stuff, do you have any recollection of doing that? I think no, none. So that's probably an error. That's what we were kind of thinking because, yeah, because that's, that's actually dated like earlier stuff. than all the other stuff. So it didn't yeah, make no, sense. that that makes no sense to me at all. No. Okay, so okay. that's that's wrong. Wrong. That, that's good to know. And, and then, then, and then also in oh maybe Jim's going to say this, but in Wikipedia it says that you're doing the Charlton stuff in '74, but all this stuff is in '76. So that's another I think thing that's just out there that's wrong. Also, I could have done something that was in that was put in the drawer in '74. That's entirely possible. I think that I think in fact I think that's accurate. I think that first one was done in '74 because I did it and. Uh, remember trying to get it done because we, we were going to London. It was the uh, days of the Freddie Laker plane flights where you could go to London for a hundred bucks. And uh, we, we had, we, we were going. <coughs> and um, I think I got that done just a little bit before and that was in 74. So I suspect it just stayed in the drawer uh, for a couple because of years. The, na the nature of those horror stories, they 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 hung around for a while. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the 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 other cover I wanted to ask you about was it was in a Fighting Marines Charlton uh, one thirty two in yeah. nineteen seventy six, yeah. and and they have you drawing that and Dan Atkins inking it, and it has Hitler on it. You know, it's it's conceivable that I've forgotten something, but I don't think so. Okay, all right. I don't think that's mine either. And I, I, nope. I'm sure I would remember Dan Atkins inking me. I've always wanted Dan Atkins to ink me, but <laughs> I don't think it ever happened. All right, all right. That's that's those are the ones that stood out as I don't know about that. So that's 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 good to know. Um, Alex Marvel. So then you were saying that John Bushima had recommended you to. Marvel through his class, he saw that he liked your style, that it stood out. Um, was that to Archie Goodwin then? Yeah, that was Archie. Okay. By the way, he pronounced it Busima. Yeah, Busima. And and you're right, it is Busima. And I always do that for some reason. I took an we Italian class do, in college. I took an Italian class in college and I'm cursed with saying his yeah, last name wrong. Um, yeah, his he, he knew it was not the Italian way. He said it had evolved from the, you know, the time they in, entered an Americanization. Right, of course. Yes, I know about that. Um, 
Anglicization is evolution. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> um, or something. Something like that. Um, now, uh, this is interesting. So then you, so then Archie then, did he kind of assign you to a book then? Because uh, it looks like that was the champions probably, right? That's, and that's he, right. And he assigned you to that. And then um, it looked like Bill Mantlo was the writer. So he was the first writer you worked with at Marvel? Yeah. Okay. And then and it looks like that was champions eight through 10 dated 1976. Uh, then you also did issue 16. How was working with Bill Mantlo? Was that Marvel style? Was there a plotting session first before a script? No, I never, I, I, I never, I don't think I ever engaged in a plotting session at Marvel. Okay. Ever. Uh, except that maybe when I finally did Emperor Doom with uh, Michelini, I, yeah. I think, I think that would be the, the only one. Everything else was, uh, people don't think of Marvel as as much of a writer orientation because of the Marvel method, but pretty much at that time, the writer would get an approval from the editor in chief and then they would assign an artist, um, to, 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 unless you were on the series, but usually the, the, you know, while you were finishing the last one, the writer was writing the next one. So, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, and working with Matt Lowe, I, I appreciated Bill and uh, always liked working with him and stayed, stayed you know, friends with him until he had his terrible accident. Uh, he uh, was very generous in saying, okay, uh, I'm gonna teach you how to read one of these scenarios, especially working with him as to what was, what was wanted. And uh, uh, I learned a lot about storytelling from from Bill, because he was he was generous with his time, uh, and I think uh, you know I think probably in those first that first one I I'm not sure I thought that Bill was the best writer going because um, I don't I don't think I, I liked the champions stories all that well, um, and when I, but when I think back because Bill I think became a very good writer and it was somebody that I turned to a lot when I was an editor um, I think it was almost an impossible group to write they were uh, I, I know that uh, when Tony Isabella originally pitched it and he told he's told me that it, he intended it as a, a buddy comic with based on on like route 66 with just the, the two x-men meeting up with people and having adventures and it grew as it was accepted as a concept, but it it grew into a group book. Yes, and the group was was one of the strangest collections of, <laughs> yeah. of characters, weird. which I suppose might be the charm of it, unless you were trying to draw Ghost Rider as your first thing that you 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 get assigned. Uh, first of all, getting a job at Marvel and getting a, getting assigned a group book, I suppose, is like being thrown not into deep water it's like being thrown into you know the bermuda triangle because uh, everything is about you, you've got to get it in within a month and i was like it's a group that all these and and ghostwriter and i'm i i'm i'm the kind of person that i should not be allowed within th six feet of a motorcycle let alone on one i knew nothing about motorcycles uh and and this was the time when you couldn't get picture reference. So, you know, it, 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 Ghost Rider, uh, to me, I look back at those and say, he looks like he's riding a bicycle <laughs> all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. the way he's sitting on it, the way the, the way the, <laughs> the, the, the and, and, and just getting enough reference to draw a motorcycle. I, I was not good enough to know how to fake stuff. And in, in drawing comics and that kind of a the kind of schedule we had, Everybody had to learn how to fake stuff so that you would, you know, you would draw the shape of a motorcycle eventually. And then if you were somebody who used a lot of reference, you could fill in and make it more realistic, but you had to be able to lay it out accurately without, without tons and tons of photo reference because you couldn't get photo reference. It was, it was hard to, to, you know, you go out and you try to find the picture, exactly the picture of a motorcycle that you need if you're drawing from a photo. It was hard. Now you, now, Artists do it all the time, but yeah, Google uh, online makes it a lot faster, obviously. But but uh, back back then, and so my first job was, I think it was the first issue. I, it might have been the second one, but 
the rule was you had to get Ghost Rider in as many scenes as possible because he was the only star at that time that was in the oh, group. Oh, I see. And he was put there to help sell the book, which I think he did not do because it was so insane to have him there because he's a loner for one yeah. thing. And Anti anti-hero, not a not a team player. Yeah, and so you but you always he was there all the time. And if he was there, his motorcycle had to be there. So my first thing I had to draw was an office on fire with Ghost Rider there on his motorcycle in the office. And it, it made me insane because the hard part was drawing an office. Uh, I had to have uh, borrow a Polaroid camera and have my wife sneak me into the office where she was doing temp work to take pictures because one of the hardest things is to draw stuff where everybody, nobody has ever looked at it closely, but yeah. everybody knows if you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Doom's laboratory is easy because everybody makes, just makes yeah. it up. Right. But, the, but the real, the real stuff is what, is what's difficult. That's interesting. Thank, thank God for Google images. Yeah. Yeah. And then now I know that you were kind of doing that kind of Bushima style at this point. Did anyone ever say draw like Jack Kirby or were you pretty much just continuing on with more of a Bushima or Bushima um, approach to it? Um, I think I was, I loved, I, I loved the class and I, I certainly became an acolyte of John's style mm -hmm. because I felt it was, it's what I'd learned. And also because I think it was what people rather expected of me right so when i turned to an image i would turn toward him it took me a while before i figured out that i i would i had not gotten the job in order to draw like john Yosema. that wasn't what was expected of me per se maybe the first couple of things but um it took me a long time to sort of do something else um so it was it was a sort it was my default uh, you know um, yeah more, more, more busima than actual kirby it sounds like yeah nobody ever said draw it like jack except that when jim shooter uh stuck over he would take it everybody went into it he would he would take artists aside and show them some jack kirby stuff that he loved early kirby before kirby started doing the big flashy stuff he loved smaller panels where kirby would pull the, the, the camera way back and you'd see a lot of stuff. That's about the only time it was when I was doing the Avengers that I thought um, I was being forced into a Kirby mode, and it wasn't the Kirby that I that you particularly liked. It was almost the more boring, the more boring Kirby in a way. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. It was no yeah. boring Kirby, but okay. It's, <laughs> it's not boring Kirby. It's it's great storytelling, but it was sort of stuff that I felt. Uh, well, this is ten years out of date, but um, yeah. And I think that was a, a lot of shooters stuff seems to have a lot of that zoomed out that you're talking about. Um, but he was very concerned that people would not understand where where comics were going, that the comics would be produced. And to some extent, he was right that, that there would be comics that that the average kid couldn't pick up off the off newsstand the and look yeah. at and understand what stories were there. And I think he was right about that. I think the only thing he was wrong about was the idea that 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 was who was reading comic books anymore you know, right that's when it was being a, being a big transition from kids to fans yeah i will say though as a kid in the 80s i did like the stuff that he had a little more control over that as a kid uh, i was born in 78 so as a kid i did appreciate it i i was able to like hook right into the marvel universe through a lot of the stuff yeah. he was overseeing so it did help me uh, integrate into it um, yeah, no, I think exactly that. And, and, you know, I felt that, you know, it felt like it felt like an accurate assessment is what you had to do. Because I, I remember I remember going to the, those spin racks that were still there when I started reading comics again and say, saying, OK, wow, well, I, I want to find the issue before this because I want to catch up on it. But I can understand it if I start at this point. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll still get it. Yeah. And, and, and we were all we were all quite concerned with the storytelling when I, when I started that, that, that you had to be able to do that. And then um, now 
uh, you did uh, FF Annual 12, 1977. This book was split in half with Keith, Keith Pollard, and the script was by Marv Wolfman. Um, it was an Inhumans issue. And uh, so did you ever have to go back to like Kirby Fantastic Four as any sort of reference on the characters? Were you already familiar with a lot of these characters by this point? Um, how, uh, how did that work? The ones that I was drawing, I was familiar with, but uh, that was the first realization of what would haunt me really for most of my career at Marvel was that I'm slow. Uh, I got much faster once I started working at Valiant. And, but I, I, I was supposed to do the whole, the whole thing. And I just could not turn that out in the length of time that was available and had to go to John for Purton and say, John, I, I can't do it. I'm, I'm just not capable of doing that at this point in my I see. In my that's, career. that's why and it was split in half like that. I see. That's why it was splitting in half. So in half. There, and there were, there were an, an, that, that happened to me several times during my, my career at Marvel that I felt, uh, uh, I think sometimes the Marvel people thought, oh, he's just off doing theater again. But the truth was that I just was too damn slow. And I think people uh, didn't quite get that because because I was John Buscema's pupil and, and Buscema was the fastest person, uh, one of the three fastest people in comics. Yeah, he could do like three pages a day or something, yeah. He could do, when he could do up to five pages if he was doing breakdowns. If it was just breakdowns, that's true. Yeah, um, and they were, and, and those breakdowns were astonishingly good. You had to have somebody as good as like a Tom Palmer Right. doing the finish on them because yes. a lot of artists unless the artist could draw really well you, you didn't know what to do or you'd try to redraw it in your style or whatever but but they were they were magnificent line drawings uh, we talked about, to anyway. tom just a couple weeks ago about exactly that about uh he talked about um doing adams and he talked about doing colon and he was saying with buschema that 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 was that it was layouts, but it was perfectly done, and how how much he enjoyed working uh, off of those pencils. Yeah, the draftsmanship inherent in those pencils was 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 crazy. Uh, it just how we could. He showed me how he did it. He was always worked with a light box, and I owned a bunch of his uh, underlays that he did. He he would do these gestural uh, drawings that were the first on the first section, and then he would go slap those on a light box and do these um, line drawings over them. The gestural drawings are magnificent. Oh, um, I see. That's cool. Cause he had like stock poses basically. No, no, no of stock poses. That's what's crazy. It was like, it was like he had done it probably holding the pencil like this. We're not going to get the pencil in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like, like this and, 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 and very sweeping and, with with John, the amazing thing was that you, you John watching John draw was like those old um, semi coloring books that you used to get, where you would you would uh, brush water on the page, and a drawing would emerge that that was hidden. Mm -hmm. And with John, it was like that. He would move his hand around almost too fast for you to see, but very elegantly, and this drawing would just start to emerge on the page wow that's cool uh, and now, it, it, it was it was astonishing yeah that sounds astonishing and i would have loved to see i have some of his pages some breakdown some um more full um and he would doodle on the back of them too but uh, yeah always yeah, yeah uh, so you worked at, okay now you also worked with mantlo on super villain team up issues 10 11 12 14 1977 now this is interesting don perlin inked a lot of that stuff and you guys worked together at Valiant. So were you guys friends? No, I never met Don until um, until I was an editor. I think a lot of the people I met Matt Lowe, a lot of the a lot of those guys, the people that I worked with, I never really met until I, I was an editor there. I, I can I tell you one story about about uh, shifting from champions to supervillain team. Yeah. 
which I thought to thank God I was able to do a, <laughs> a book with a contained number of characters. Yeah. Um, but I was at, uh, I think it was the New York, yeah, it was the New York Comic Con. I think it was just called the New York Comic Con then. And uh, it wasn't Read Pop at that point. It was just one of the early Comic Cons. And this kid who couldn't have been more than 10 came up and said, you're Bob Hall, right? And I said, yeah, how'd you know? He said, somebody told me. <laughs> you're, you, you were working on, on, on the uh, champions. And I said, yeah, that's what I'm doing. He said, no, you're not. They're going to put you on Supervillain Team Up. And then he, they're going to give that to John Byrne and put you on Supervillain Team Up. And he walked away. And it was the first experience I'd had with a fan, especially uh -huh. a preteen fan, knowing more about what was going on in the Marvel office than I did. <laughs> that, that was, it was fandom. Now I understand fandom. Yeah. No, you're not. You're going to do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, now. Uh, okay. So then now around this time, then 78 uh, starts coming up and Archie Goodwin uh, then uh, is no longer editor in chief. Jim Shooter becomes editor in chief. Do you recall like that shift? Um, and any changes in Marvel at the time? And were you at the bullpen a lot when you when you were there? Uh, well, I would go in the bull, the bullpen on a regular basis because that's how you got work. Yeah, it is um, especially if you were doing books like the Champions. And I was on the this book is going to fail uh, end of the Marvel universe at the time. Uh, and you would, uh, they, they used those books well. They used them as training grounds for people and they would shift people, new people around and see how you did. Um, but yeah, uh, the, um, there were a lot of changes. It was the, um, Edit, the, Archie, when Archie was there, it was the time of the writer editor. And um, I, I was glad I didn't get mixed up with that very much because I was working for Matt Lowe and Matt Lowe was giving me, you know, it was a more typical relationship. He would give me the Marvel scenario. You didn't get, almost nobody was working from that kind of Stan Lee thing where he called up and, and just gave you a real quick uh, synopsis of what you were going to do. Yeah, they, they would be written out um, usually um, page by page as a scenario with no dialogue or maybe one place where the writer knew damn well that he wanted you to do a, 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 a panel where there was a major speech and he would, he would have heard that in his head and he would write that out for you. Um, but uh, the writer editors, of course, were notoriously just their books got for the most part later and later and later uh, and that was a, a big problem and some of the books went off into kind of a strange place uh, that, that wasn't true of all of them sometimes in, in hearing that it sounded like that was happening with everybody and I'm sure it wasn't but the books at Marvel because of this revolving door of um, uh, editor-in-chief. Uh, Archie was probably the most successful one of that. You know, we had Len and uh, and Marv. Who did we, who did we have? We had Len, we had Archie. Who else was? Is there somebody else who was editor-in-chief? I can't remember. Well, Marv Wolfman was also an editor-in-chief. That's right. It was Marv. It was Marv. Yeah. And, and, you know, you had to have some, some consistency there to get the books on time. And Archie uh, is a wonderful, probably one of the best editors ever to exist in comics, but not necessarily as an editor in chief, whose job was primary job was making sure it was a business and that it got done at that point because Marvel was turning into a different kind of company. Yes, and and uh, Jim was quite capable of doing that, and I think really saved Marvel's butt. By, right, because uh, yeah. what Al Landau in '75 was like president, and then some things were happening with the money. So Jim Galton comes in, and now he was the one that kind of wanted everything to be more business run. And then Jim Shooter, probably becoming editor in chief, was instrumental in making that happen. 
I would, I, yes, he was very much so. And he, and, uh, you know, I was part of the first wave of editors. He, he called me and asked if I wanted to be an editor. And I had done the play at that point. I had taken time off from Marvel because we were doing the play. And, uh, you know, that's getting a play on off Broadway. Is a, a, we were rewriting constantly and, uh, off, especially, and especially off Broadway, we were all doing more than one thing with the, with the production and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so um, Jim called me up and said, you want to be an, I, I would like to be, to be an editor. And I thought about it and didn't really want to do it. Um, and one reason I didn't want to do it was that it looked like Passion of Dracula was going to get option to be done in London. And I certainly was going to go to London if that, if that happened. And I, I wasn't quite sure it was going to happen. And so I didn't feel like committing to that sounded, the job sounded like a big commitment. And um, Jim kept calling me back and wanting me to do it. And I think Jim thought I was negotiating because it, he kept offering me more money. <laughs> and, and we, and we, and finally, cause I had never made any money the time I was in New York and doing Marvel, you started at, you start your page rate when you first started was something like, I think it was slightly less than 30 bucks a page. And, and if, if, unless you were very fast, just couldn't make much money. And I thought, wow, I can make enough money doing this to successfully go to London. And uh, so I made the deal that I would do it for six months. And that if the London thing was gonna happen, then I would leave and, and, and do that. And he said, great. And so, so I did it for six months. And uh, indeed, all of, every book that I had was behind except for Devil Dinosaur done by Jack Kirby, which was six months ahead, but uh, uh, which was sort of typical Kirby. But most of, my, most of my job during that time was to try to get the books back on time. And that was what we were all doing for a while. We weren't doing that editorship of planning stories and uh, all, of, all of that stuff came later. This was about nuts and bolts of these, these, these books have got a get back on a monthly schedule. Interesting. So then um, did you find that you faced some backlash from the artists and writers then when you tried to reel them in like that? Um, it, for the most part, it involved um, just telling people that, okay, hey, look, this is the, this is the situation now. And, and people would go with it. I think everybody kind of knew that that had to happen. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of things, and I won't talk about who or what, where um, the only solution was was to fire somebody because uh, things were behind and they clearly weren't going to get more on time. Mm, and I then, see. Then, and it's, it, that was that would always that was the least fun part about it because you were firing people who were sometimes um, in a cup in, in in one instance in particular it was a very talented person, but it just was clear that it was not working. And uh, and then you were you would turn toward uh, some of the remarkable, remarkably fast artists to uh, get things back on time. So um, getting uh, usually it would be Sal Buscema or John was John at that time was pretty much his own man. You could get him to, to do some feeling kind of work, but he, he was pretty much assigned to what he was doing and, and you, you weren't going to be able to get him to help you out. But Sal, Sal was uh, still at that point where they were, he was the go-to guy and, and he wasn't firmly on the Hulk yet. Um, and we got him on the Hulk and uh, um, I think uh, John, Don Perlin ended up on, on the Defenders and, and some some things like that that were behind that that you you mm -hmm. you, re you solved it that way. This is interesting, yeah, because you you had because um, just to name a few issues uh, under that time, the some Marvel team up issues. Um, Mary Jo Duffy was in, your assistant editor. Um, there was a, 
uh, Chris Claremont and John Byrne was kind of uh, working under you there in that kind of the beginning part of that. There was an interesting issue, the Marvel team up 74, uh, where you actually had Saturday Night Live. Uh, yeah. In the not issue. ready for time, time, time players, technically. Yeah, not ready for prime time players. Um, and you did the interior art for that. Uh, Cochran did the cover. Chris Claremont wrote that one. And then Mary Severin, I guess, because it was a comedic one, Mary Severin then inked that issue. H how did that issue come to be? Uh, well, uh, Chris pitched it and we all liked it. And uh, uh, I don't know who, probably Shooter, went to uh, manage to make the contact with Saturday Night Live. I, I can't remember who did that. Uh, and... Uh, probably to Lauren Michaels and, and they said yes. And uh, then I was editing Team Up and uh, I was damned if I was gonna not, not do it myself because I knew we would get to go to 30 Rock and meet those people and uh, mm -hmm. sit in on rehearsal and, uh, uh, and, we, and we did. And uh, so that was great fun and the, um, Loved doing it. The only problem I had with it was that Chris was a television watcher and I'm not a television watcher. So Chris would, I, I watched Saturday Night Live. I love Saturday Night Live, but he would want characters from the Muppet Show to be in it and stuff. And I, I didn't know who <laughs> these people were. And, but, and, and, and they had, he had to get me reference because I, um, uh, again, the reference problem, if you turned on the TV, those characters weren't going to be there until, you know, it, you might go be three or four weeks before they would appear so um uh but but it was it was a fun project we did get to meet um to say hello to most of them but we did give the cover to uh belushi and got to he invited us to the opening uh, night party for the rap party for uh or maybe it was the opening i guess i guess it was the opening of animal house and uh, um we got to meet him and give him the had a little bit longer conversation with him and give him the cover um that's the cool thing about living everything being in new york it's all close yeah. like that yeah yeah and uh oh i remember that there was one there was one weird thing that happened with it that was had to do with coming from nebraska and that was that the uh the lawyer for nbc we, we tried to figure out well what would we how would we do the the, the logos stuff on the um, on the comic and we we felt we had to represent NBC in some way and and the show but we couldn't put everybody's face on the cover uh, actually I kind of wanted to do that I thought it looked like uh, an old Blackhawk comic but but that wasn't what was wanted uh, and we and so I said well, well let's use the NBC symbol and everybody said, yeah, that's a great idea. And then we got a call from the NBC office and their lawyer invited us. We, we didn't invite us, so you have to come talk to me about using that symbol. <laughs> and we sat in the office and the guy and, and the guy said, now you cannot change this symbol in any way. And we said, well, okay, fine. He, he, he said, no, yeah, it's a trademark symbol. You have to be careful. That you don't understand. You really cannot change it. And he said, you can't in any way. You can't. And, and we got to the point where you were saying, well, there's what, what's what's the real deal here? This is, this is, yeah, yeah, we got it. What's what he's, he keeps stating it. And I, it suddenly the, the light dawned on me. And I said, I understand I'm from Nebraska. And he said, then you know what I'm talking about. And I said, yes, I do. And that, that was the end of the meeting. And we got in the hall and I think Shooter was there and, and Mary Jo and, and they said, what just happened? And I said, there's, a uh, educational television station in associated with the University of Nebraska. And this guy, Jim Brown, was their staff artist. And he invented the NBC symbol only for Nebraska television. And it was exactly the same as, as what they later came up with. Uh, the NBC eventually came up with, with their symbol, post uh, Nebraska Television having the same one, 
Oh. And so it was already trademarked. And they, Nebraska sued them. <laughs> and, and they had to settle for, uh, I think eventually they, they settled out of court and gave them a remote truck, which is what they really wanted. <laughs> And so that was the story. That was the guy was all funny. about this. There's like actually a legal, a legal thing there. Yeah, um, yeah, weird. Yeah, and then um, you also worked with um, Chaikin uh, doing uh, Doctor Strange. Um, you did a nice. Uh, well, that was Marvel. It was Marvel team up. It's just Doctor Strange was the was the guest in that. Was one. the guest in that one. And then um, there's also a Marvel two in one thing in Hercules forty four in nineteen seventy eight. It says that you penciled the cover. There's a question mark in the Grand I did Comics. Not, I, I did not pencil the cover. Oh, you I did, did the interior. Oh, oh, that's interesting. You did the layouts so, on the interior. They've got you but, drawing. But they and have you the as, cover. as actually penciling and inking the cover too. That's wrong then. I believe that's wrong. I'll take a look at it, but I don't think I did the. I don't think I did the cover. I, I might have done the cover. Maybe I did. Oh, no, I did do the cover. It's a no, good no, cover. There you go. You should I take remember credit the, for it. I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of something else. No, I'm thinking of a Capcom cover. Yes, I go. did the cover. I did the cover as well. And did and you it was, ink it too? Um, I don't remember. I might have. I think I did. I, I think it might have been the first cover that I inked myself. Uh, okay. So GCD may have gotten that one right then. Yeah, and, and it was... It, it was, I remember that issue because I did full pencils and Giacoya inked it. And I, I really appreciated Frank Giacoya's inking. He also inked um, a uh, supervillain team up that I did, I think, or, or it, it might've been a, a, somewhere in there. He, I, did, I got two things inked by Frank. And they were the first time I thought, thought that it all looked professional. You know, it really looked, he really made me look like I knew what I was doing. And, and um, I had no, I had, it was the first time I had almost no quarrel with any of the, of how it was turning out. Because a lot of, a lot of, I think you're, John Byrne was somebody who came in with a style that controlled the inker. Almost anybody who, who didn't, if you, unless you tried to really change him, you just followed his pencils and it would right. turn out well. Controlling the inker, that's, that's an interesting concept, yeah. And, and um, I, I was struggling to do that. It, it, it was not turning out the way I had hoped it would turn out. So, um, so that, one, that one did, and I, I, I recall it fondly. Yeah. Um, now, you also uh, took over editing Defenders um, from Shooter around issue 61. <laughs> Um, you're both listed as editor on that issue. So it sounds like it got handed off to you in the middle of it, maybe. Um, probably. Probably, that makes sense. And then, um, uh, now, it seems like toward the end of the editing, like Al Milgram kind of came in after you. Is that correct? It got it went to Al Milgram after, after you? Yeah, they were looking for... Uh the next editor, because I knew we knew I was going to leave. It, it, they do, were doing it in London. And so I said, yeah, it is happening. And so, um, and about that time, uh, Al was let go by DC. And I heard that he was available and suggested that Al be the person to take him over. Oh, you suggested uh, that? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's from the DC implosion that uh, him and DeFalco and other people went over there. Yeah, uh, I, the... I, I would like to. I, I would like to see Mary Jo take it over, but ah, uh -huh. that wasn't happening yet at Marvel. It, it, oh, that's it, interesting. Uh, that was, and that's just my opinion. I just think it wasn't. That wasn't something that was ready to happen yet. Uh, I think she would have been great. Interesting. So almost like maybe you had mentioned that to Shooter, and he he. Uh... I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I think it's my fault. I think. I think I sort of uh, felt that that was the way it seemed to be working that it was at the time all, all, of, all of the all of the people who had come in at this point were were men and men i sort of thought yeah. well well that's the deal and and you gotta remember it was the 70s and i sort of thought well i guess that's the deal rather yeah. than thinking why don't i suggest you know yeah. so i, I still kind of feel a cultural subconscious thing yeah um you also edited daredevil around this time a few issues there um, and there were some that were drawn by Gene Colan. Did you know Gene Colan? 
Yeah, the the um, I got to know Gene after he did that um, that thing with the with the Dracula play. Oh, okay. And and uh, he invited me and my wife out to his house and uh, played. Uh, he had a movie studio in his house, and uh, or, or I mean not a not for taking movies, but I mean for showing. He had a showing room, a viewing room, and. Uh, um, he had the, uh, I think I think we watched King Kong, uh, but it was great to go out and just see some of his work hanging on the wall, some of his early commercial work too was, it was, I really liked Gene a lot. And uh, um, again, it's one of those things, it's an odd thing that I'm not listed as the editor for the issue where Gene, Gene started doing it again. Cause I think it was another one of those things where I was just, starting as editor and it got handed off to me but i i wasn't credited but i know that that i that people were saying well who can who can do daredevil we were looking for an artist for daredevil and i said well hey i want to call gene let's see if i can get gene back on the book for a while yeah and so and i remember that as being one of my things that i thought okay i've done some good yeah that, that, that's a good artistic move we'll get gene back on daredevil for a while and then how about uh frank robbins i think he drew one of those as well right um i don't remember if he did i don't, did a daredevil he the one i remember frank with was the human fly okay he he and, did a daredevil during your editing um i i checked it last night i'm sure i'm sure he may have i just don't remember it uh I remember, I remember the human fly because we 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 kept we kept going through inkers and uh, I think Lealoha did some of the some of his stuff and made him look made Robbins look pretty good, but it didn't quite look like Robbins. And eventually, I put uh, Frank Springer on him, which yeah. I thought was was a good team because I was looking for somebody that made Robbins. I mean. Robbins, I think, is one of those guys. If you, I know there were people that didn't like his work, but he just needed to look like Robbins. I mean, Frank Robbins is Frank Robbins, you know, and, and yeah. trying to give him a different look just just isn't there. You know, he needs to he needs to be what he is. And, and Springer Spring, could do that. Springer was his best anchor during the Marvel um, stuff. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it, it worked really well. I agree with you. Now, um, also then Hulk, you did uh, a few issues of Hulk also, um, and you also edited that uh, Hulk Annual 7, uh, December 1978 by uh, Stern and Byrne, and, and that was a great issue. Um, so when you're editing, are, are, are you giving feedback on the art, or is it mostly the script and then assigning who does the issue? Um, depended on, it, it really depended on, uh, what it was, uh, there would there would be times when I would give feedback on the art. Uh, there would be times when you feel felt you didn't have to give feedback on anything, and you were sort of praying for that to happen because, you know, you were juggling all of these, all, all of these books and trying to make sure they all got out and, and, and stuff. So it was very nice when you, somebody like Stern and a combination like Stern and and Byrne were were pretty self contained. You know, you had two of the ultimate pros going. Right. Right, because they had a great Captain America run, obviously, too. And uh, mm -hmm. so now um, in 1979, you did the Human Fly um, cover to issue 17, five Tarzan issue covers. You can go over Sal Buscema on some interiors, you can over John on some covers. Um, so tell us about that, working on Human Fly and some of those Tarzan images. And did you like Tarzan? And what was up with the Human Fly? Uh, well, the human fly was weird. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was, it was strange because uh, Stan had apparently met the human. Now, you, you know, the human fly was a real guy. Yeah, Rick Rojack or something like that. I, I can't remember. Uh, probably that sounds right. And Stan had met him uh, at a party or something, and thought, "What a great idea for a comic!" And so we did it. And. Uh, yeah, it was kind of fun in that um, it, it, it was not superhero, and it was, it was sort of fun to do a not one non-superhero book, although he was sort of a semi-superhero. Um, and 
there was something about it that it never quite, I don't think anybody believed that was really going to take off. Because he was like a he, like a evil Knievel type of stuntman, right? Mask. He was an evil Knievel stuntman, but shortly after we started doing the book, he stopped doing stunts. And part of the deal was we felt, well, we'll sell the book because he'll be doing these stunts like evil Knievel. And unless he gets killed, his, the stunts will help sell the book. And we eventually thought whatever it's good, great stunt he comes up with, we'll, we'll try to incorporate it into the book. Uh, and he just kind of stopped doing stunts and uh, came up to the office with, he had, he had, he had a, he wanted us to put in a sidekick and uh, the, the, he brought him up and induced him and he said, this is, this is Speedy, my sidekick. And <laughs> this is unfair, but we, 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 several of us in the editorial department got together afterwards and said, Speedy, look, this looks like this guy picked Speedy up in a bus station. This is, this is, <laughs> this, this is, this, this is not good. This is maybe outside good. of a studio 54 or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we got to get, um, we got, we got to get him to do more stunts. That's the whole idea. And so I called and pressured him to, you, you got to do more stunts. And uh, eventually he called me back and said, I, I, I got it. I'm going to fly across country for Easter, strapped to the wing of a Boeing, Boeing 707. And I said, <laughs> OK. And, and they talked about it and, and told other people. And I said, this is what he just told me. And I said, the only question I have, do we tell him that he's going to die if he does this? Or do we just <laughs> let him do it? Just let him do it. It's fun. <laughs> and eventually he decided not to do it. And, and the book got canceled about the same time. But the good thing about the book was uh, uh, that for some reason, Jim decided because of not being a superhero, didn't have to have a Marvel look, that he would ask me to use a number of uh, older artists who were looking for work who had uh, amazing backgrounds, but were not doing sort of the Marvel style. So yeah. I got to work with uh, uh, Frank and Bob Lubers and uh, Lee Elias. Yeah. And, and they were all, you know, they were superb. They, they were all just wonderful. Um, and Which I, I, one did the splash page, the opening page where he's just playing the guitar? Because that's that's the one that I remember. Don't remember. I don't remember. Those don't were all. Remember. Those were also fun. And that's the only reason I bought the book at the time was because I re I knew that who they were bringing out the artists and it was a real treat. Lee Elias yeah. was especially good. And Lee Elias, it was great to see his pencils come through. He had a unique style. He worked with a with a a stump. You know what I mean? They they a a, a paper paper stump, and so he would put in the black areas. Uh, by by rubbing the pencil with this with this stump, which doesn't sound that interesting, I guess, except that they, they were beautiful. They were beautiful pencil drawings, just gorgeous. Yeah, I like his uh, Beyond Mars strip, and because uh, I he I think he's always thought of as somewhat of a Kniff imitator, but he had his own skill, obviously. Yeah. Um, all right, so then well, and that that was that was actually. Uh, the kind of the problem is you would get people who had been raised in the Kniff school and we were definitely, you know, everybody wanted to look like Adams at that point. And, oh. uh, and, you know, if you were with it, you, your, your stuff looked like Adams, I guess. I see. Uh, it was almost old fashioned to be a Kniff imitator in 1979. Almost, almost you could, you could be, you could be other kinds of things, but the Kniff, the Kniff school was sort of out, which was really too bad. Cause it's really a superb, superb stuff yeah sure but somehow didn't somehow didn't seem to fit with the superhero um genre as it was being done at that point so yeah yeah i think even john ramita transitioning from his kniff style in the 50s to his uh, marvel style in the 60s i actually although it looks smooth and sleek i think it was actually hard for him to make that adjustment but once he did obviously and he was yeah. a great art director and all that stuff, but it's still a different thing. And there's a transition. Yeah. Um, and you can still, you can always see it in, in when, when, 
when John would would feel he had to redraw a face on a cover, uh, that Kniff style that he re the part of the Kniff that he retained would be would be sometimes very much like, um, oh, this. John Romita redrew that face, you know, and it would, it would be, it would, <laughs> and there was a Kniff face there. That's great. There would be a, there would be a, a Romita Kniff face. Yeah. A Romita, uh, Romita size Kniff face. Right. Exactly. And, um, and Bob, I just looked, it was, uh, it was, uh, Lee Elias was the one that did, uh, the human fly kick back on the couch playing the guitar. Or cool. um, uh, and that one stood out, but Goodwin was editing it by that point. So that's, that's probably why yeah. it's not in your mind. Yeah. yeah. And then you took a break from comics, and that was basically to go to do to work on your theater, right? Yeah, it, it was spent um, oh, at least four weeks in London, and uh, um, came back, and I have no memory of exactly what happened when I came back. Um, I know I went back to doing stuff. You probably know more about it than I do. That's sort of a vague period for me um, up until Shooter asking me to do the Avengers. Yeah, and uh, the, the database, uh, 1980 is a complete blank. You have zero credits. Well, that's why it's blank. That's why, that's, that's why it's vague to me. It was, I apparently was going through vagueness. I actually think I was doing a lot of theater at that point. I was uh, being a guest artist at uh, Cornell University um, and working at the George Street Playhouse and uh, yeah, doing just doing more theater work. All right, so now we have to talk about the Avengers. Um, this is the tricky part because I... I hate what happens now. Um, I mean, like beyond hate, because if I was if I was a a kid in juvenile, I would say that Ant Man was one of my favorite. Hank Pym was one of my favorite characters. But I'm an adult, so I'm not going to say that. Um, Hawkeye is my favorite character. But 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 I um i don't think it's i it's 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 such a different controversy because i want to read what uh jim shooter says about mm -hmm. it and then let's talk about about that because he kind of in my opinion hangs you out to dry on this after the criticisms come in um where he says in in that story issue 213 and for anybody that doesn't know we're talking about hank pym um walloping the wasp yep committing domestic violence against the wasp. And, mm -hmm. and part of my distaste, Bob, is I'm a, uh, when I'm not doing the comics stuff, I'm a divorce lawyer and I deal with domestic violence all the time. So this, this one's a little personal for me. Um, also, I think this was a turning point in comics the same way that the 1986 uh, stuff over at DC with Dark Knight and Watchmen was that this was the beginning of a darker, tone to comics that i never liked especially um, and, and this was like kind of a little after like the jim shooter hulk story of the rape at the ymca and stuff like that so there's there's a few different things that, that were happening shooters doing that Englehart's doing some stuff later in uh, west coast avengers things that that there's a lot more rape and a lot more um brutality going on um in superhero comics um so in this issue uh hank pym who's kind of lost his mind at the time um there's this a panel where he just knocks the hell out of the wasp over to the corner and and what shooter says is that wasn't his intent that he had a very nuanced um notion of of this and it wasn't going to be like that and that um i'm going to read it so i don't get it wrong in that story there's a scene in which hank is supposed to have accidentally struck jan while throwing his hands up in despair and frustration making a sort of get away from me gesture while not looking at her. Bob Hall, who has been taught by John Buscema to always go for the most extreme action, turned that into a right cross. There was no time to have it redrawn, which to this day has caused the tragic story of Hank Pym to be known as the wife beater story. When that issue came out, Ben um, 
Sienkiewicz came to me upset that I hadn't asked him to draw it. He saw the intent right through Hall's mistake and was moved enough by the story to wish he'd had the chance to do it properly. By the way, I was too busy to finish the story, so Roger Stern took over two thirds of the way through. I thought he did a great job. So what's your response to, does that jive with your memory of it? And if, and I've read your response to it, but I, I didn't know if that was still your mindset. So I just wanna ask you, what do you uh, think of that? I don't know. My, my, my biggest response to it is that, what was the date of that? Uh, the, the know, issue. Oh, the, oh, the issue itself, 1981. 1981, yeah. 1981. So that's 40 years ago. That's my response to it. That's 40 years ago. And I don't think anybody remembers anything accurately after 40 years. Uh, so I think Jim's um, memory of it is probably as accurate as Jim can remember it. And I won't, I won't try to dispute it. Uh, I know that, yes, I had trouble drawing it. I couldn't, I wasn't sure what was wanted. I eventually did that. Uh, I don't think I got to the point where I could pull off something subtle for another three or four years. Uh, I, I think I was, I think mo all of the work that I did on the Avengers was crap. Uh, it was another group book, and I don't think I ever felt comfortable doing it. Uh, it always felt to me like uh, I had more to draw than I could fit in. I always wished that I had, uh, in fact, when I was working with Roger I went, uh, on West Coast Adventures, I think I eventually said, look, if you can write me, these are 22 page stories, if you can write me 20 pages and just give me two pages to do something interesting, uh, so I can expand action rather than trying to, to draw a million panels. But I was never comfortable doing it and felt, no, I don't think I did a very good job on it. Uh, I, uh, so I think that part of it is, is probably true. Uh, my, I do have the reaction that, that next, I, and, but, and then, I, then I have a different reaction to it as a writer, which is that the next day, she shows up uh, at the Avengers headquarters with a, uh, uh, a black eye. So clearly she, something had happened and, and to her that was brutal. Didn't have to be that brutal. You know, they, they, uh, I read a book on boxing. One time I was trying to figure out, God, God I'm sick of doing fights that look like Roundhouse rights, and I got a book on on boxing that had a bunch of photographs. And, they, and they, uh, I think it was I don't remember if it was Ring Lardner. I can't remember who who wrote it, but he said that the hardest punch he ever shot uh, saw thrown in his life was Rocky Marciano hitting. I believe it was Ezra Charles. Charles had dropped his guard. He was actually winning the fight. He had dropped his guard. Marciano saw the opening and that the blow traveled maybe twelve inches, and. Boom. So I'm, I'm, I certainly am not disputing that it could have been a more subtle um, slap or hit, but it definitely um, gave her a black eye. So that was part of the plot. Now, my sense of it is if that happened by accident, then the entire story um, should have been scrapped that if, if he didn't slap her and intend to hit her, that then the idea that, the idea that this, ha oh, it happens by accident. Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't buy that for a second. I think the intention of the story is that he, the, the marriage is sour, he's crazy. It builds to the point that he hits her and, um, uh, and I think the the uh, the hit ends up in in the story uh, uh, with Hank implicitly is that Hank is is involved in that syndrome of people who 
hit their wives or hit their spouse. It can be the other way around too, of saying, see what you made me do. And I and think without that syndrome being there, there's no story. I couldn't agree with you more. If you go back and read the story and it's not just Hank, but Janet Pym is acting like an abused, like a, a, a spouse that got hit and she's lying about it. She's making excuses. Everything mm -hmm. that, that both of those characters do indicate that that's how that entire story is written, not just the, not the one, one pan panel. Yeah. That, it that was intended did. to be domestic violence. Like when she takes her sunglasses off at work and her coworkers see it and they're like shocked and concerned, right? That's what happens at Avengers Mansion. Yeah, she's lying about it. And that's that's a sign that, that she was being abused, not that there was an accident where he accidentally raised his hand like that. So I think your your interpretation of that as a writer is exactly spot on. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. And on the other hand, I think, you know, uh, yes, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz could have handled it more subtly. I uh, didn't really know I, I knew that at the time. I, I, I tried drawing it more subtly and it never seemed to work when I did it. Uh, uh, I think it took a level of draftsmanship to do that that I did not, I had not obtained at that point. And so that's that's the part of it that I would agree is my fault. Uh, just it, and it wasn't an in, a, a matter of intent, it was a matter of I did what I could. Did you get a lot of uh, blowback for it uh, at conventions and things? Did people come and talk to you about it? Oh, I don't consider it blowback. I consider it interesting to have had this be the most iconic thing in my career. And I'm sorry for that, that I, <laughs> I've done that to Good you. Good going, well. Jim. Thanks a lot, no, Jim. No, it, 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 it always happens. And I think people are, I, I think what people are, what seems to strike people If it wasn't for this particular moment, I don't think I would have said much about, I didn't think I was a very good artist at the time. I, I, I don't think I had, I think there were a few things that I'd done that were okay. And people are just, that's, that seems to be what gets people upset. And I understand why is I'm saying, I'm taking something that they remembered and saying, oh, I, well, I wasn't very good. And, you know, you know, I, I, I think it's important to know kind of at some point, at some point about this time, and it had something to do with that issue that I looked at and said, that I'm not doing what I want to do. And I started going back to um, square one with drawing and uh, started going to a studio in New York uh, called the Stacy Studio, and they just had a model in uh, three or four times a week. And I would go in three or four times a week and spend three hours drawing, drawing naked people, drawing models, trying to get the fig the draftsmanship where I thought I could do something like that and pull it off. Because in, um, in five years' time, when Emperor Doom comes out. I suspect that people come up to you and talk about that book in a very different way. That, that that's a fan favorite. I know it's I, I, it might be, but nobody ever comes up and talks to me about that book. Really? The only feedback I've gotten from that book. Uh, I think babe, that's probably not completely true, but but no, it's not part of the regular Marvel universe. And people who are heavy duty fans are into the continuity stuff, I think. But no, I think that was the best work I, I did at Marvel. But uh, um, some years that's ago- That's what I was thinking. I, so I, I'm disappointed everybody else isn't doing that because that's what I would have said to you. There, There's an op-ed, um, uh, nationally syndicated writer named Leonard Pitt, who uh, uh, is in, all kinds of papers, and uh, he um, doing editorial stuff, and he he uh, wrote something about 
uh, the nature of power and stuff and referenced Emperor Doom. And I wrote, I wrote to the guy and said, I drew that. I was, I was so pleased that you remembered it after, after 20 years. And he said, oh yes, I've never forgotten that. The, he said, the idea that thing has nuanced that Dr. Doom actually does a damn good job uh, of running the, of run, the trains run on time, but nobody has free will. He said the concept of free will and with a benign uh, dictator was 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 a fascinating problem to have explored, and and I appreciated that. So that's the best feedback I've gotten on that book. That's great. Um, all right, at uh, in eighty one as well, there was, and I I think it it might even have been a, a fill in. Um, I don't know, but Spider Man two twenty two. Um, is uh, you draw the uh, speed demon, formerly the wizard. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure. So that's the first time that you, that's sort of a harbinger of things to come in that that's the first time you're drawing one of the, uh, the squadron. Well, this is squadron sinister, but what, what will become the squadron supreme um, book that, that you do. Uh, is that the first yeah. time that you, you did any, any of those characters? Oh yeah, I believe so. Yes, I believe so. Yes, and and yet you you redesign. Did you redesign the costume, or did someone else? Uh, you know, I don't remember. I think that there were. I think I had some input into some of the costumes uh, in in the new ones, but I I I I, I expect that I would I expect that they were redesigned for me. I, I think I would remember if I really did the designs. I think I, there were some tweaks that I suggested. Um, but I, but I, suspect, I suspect that they were done in-house by somebody. And I, I'm, 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 I'll let Alex ask about the, the actual Squadron Supreme. I was just asking about when the wizard became uh, Speed Demon, that costume. Oh, no, no. That, that one was just... Uh, 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 I, I don't know who came up with the design, but at that point, you usually got a, you were presented that you were presented the job with a design. Okay. And, and then in 81... Especially, especially on team-ups, because uh, team-ups were not considered the place where people, costumes got altered, you know. And in the same year in 81, you're starting to do some work for, um, for DC as well. Um, are these, uh, these, are these all done by, um, they're the, uh, weird war tales and is that under the war editing or is that under, um, Joe Orlando and the, the horror <coughs> editing? I, I take it that's under the, um, the, the war books, right? It's under the war books. Yeah. And I don't you remember, did, I don't, who did I talk to? Who was the editor? I don't even really remember. I'm not sure. Um, because it changed over time. Was Kubert doing it at that point? No, I would have remembered that. Okay. Um, so you do you do uh, one with um, he with did Barr. he did some of he did some of the covers, which was an embarrassment because he was so much better than the one more than the inside. <laughs> uh, well, you know, not, it, not hard. Not hard with Joe. Yeah. Weird War Tales does have some really amazing Alex Toth um, short stories. He did a few. Uh, that yeah. are, are stand out. Um, uh, you did three, I think. One was, uh, or a couple with, one was with Barr, one was with uh, Demetrius, and um, you did a House of Mystery story with uh, called New Hope with um, Dan Mishkin and Gary Cohn. The House of Mystery story I don't remember that at all. I, 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 I'm listed. I know I am, and I can't remember it. I'll ask those memory? guys. I'm friends with both of those. Uh, Gary lives in Richmond, where I'm from. I'll, uh, I'll ask them about it. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the weird war was. I, I think what I wanted to do was. I just was. 
beginning to become kind of tired of superhero stuff. There you go. Exclusively. And I wanted to do something else. And um, I enjoyed doing them. I was always a little bit disappointed in the, in the finish. Uh, John, Don Cellardo, I think it's Cellardo. It might be Cellardo. John, do you know? Do you know yeah, the, the Cellardo. He did the, gosh, the, the, the Captain Easy after, uh, um, you know, he, he took over Captain Easy at some point. Well, he was he, he it was a thrill for me to have him ink it, although I don't think it turned out very well. But but he 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 was the um, Tarzan artist when I was a kid who was doing uh, my Sunday paper Tarzan. And he was he he was I, I, I just the other day somebody posted one of his Tarzans and it's a very Bern Hogarth uh, derivative Tarzan. But uh, he was he was. It was the Tarzan artist for me, and I used to imitate it when I was a kid. So the fact that he did it, I, I, I'm still kind of thrilled at certain people that I got inked by certain people. Yeah, and, and that he is was cool. one of them. Even, even, even. I don't think we were compatible, but but uh, still, it was. It's like uh, th- I think that's great. Uh, uh, him, uh, oh god and i'm blanking on his name the the guy the, the big influence on adams the, the heart of juliet jones uh guy um trying to see if i have one right around here never mind right, oh, but, uh, um i also i just looked up uh the editor on weird war tales during that period was uh was lynn wayne that's what i kind of thought was lynn yeah if I had had to, if I had had to answer the question, I would have said Len. Was he a good editor? I don't know. Okay. I don't. He never. I don't think we ever had any interaction on that book. So, I, I mean, he certainly was did some successful stuff at Marvel. Uh, at that particular one, I think that I think that was sort of a. Uh, it was kind of a throwaway book, maybe. Um, for him, I don't, I don't think it, it was. I don't think it was taken that seriously. There was yeah. not an attempt to make it into a really, really great-looking book. The covers were really good, though. The covers were magnificent. Uh, yeah. Oh, and you know the other thing I really liked about it. Now that I think about it, is the um, oh uh, the the EC artist that did all the the planes. Um, um, he came back out and, and did a lot of work for that. The the one that did Aces High. What Angela mm-hmm. Torres or something like that? No, no, not not Torres. Um, he he only did plain stuff. Um, well, I'll, I'll I'll think of it. But but he was he was a, a really good war artist uh, dealing with uh, double you know um, those biplanes, and he came back and worked for uh, uh, for for those books. The, so the, I think I had a, a uh, Hispanic artist did the second one, I think, of, of the Weird War Tales. And it, it, it was, at any rate, it was a lot better. It was, it was pretty well inked. And let's see. There was a, a Charlton cover that popped up, and I'm sure that was just one that was in an inventory. You, you never went back to Charlton to do anything, did you? No. Um, what to say I did there's it a was, cover to scary tales 27 but probably yeah like Jim said inventory that's what I was thinking too yeah scary tale I think with the, maybe that was the the Martian kind of flying saucer one and and um George Evans was the artist that I'm I'm thinking of oh sure 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 yeah and that was that was really nice to see see him get uh, work again uh, during yeah. that period yeah really good artist. And Alex, back to Marvel and back to you. Yeah. So, um, and uh, I, you know, personally, I loved your Marvel. I love your Marvel lady stuff still. Uh, but uh, even the stuff that you don't like, I like. Uh, but uh, that's good. That's yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, really, I can I can read that stuff anytime. Uh, now, in 1982, pretty much through 1991, you're working over at Marvel Avengers. We mentioned before, Squadron Supreme. There's a really great Thor Annual 10, 1982. It had like the dark hold and like the Marvel kind of chthonic creation myth of Marvel that you penciled. And that's great because they referenced that in later stories. 
Um, and then you also then co-create the West Coast Avengers in 1984 with Roger Stern, which I love that book. Um, tell us about how that came about. Um, it came about the same way I've described everything coming about at Marvel is that <laughs> you, 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 get, you, got, you got called up and said, would you like to do this book? And uh, uh, Roger, uh, I'm sure, pitched the idea uh and got to go ahead and uh i i would i would like to think i was the first choice artist but i doubt it i would suspect that i was available and uh i'm pleased that i got a chance to work with roger working with there is something about working with with um certain people that you just say oh this is easy right and roger roger is one of them and uh like as far as being like visually able to write the story something like that yeah he writes visually he writes economically uh and and he gives you a little space yeah and uh i thought i thought squadron was uh i'm, I'm sorry uh west coast was maybe the first thing i did at marvel that i was there were there were two things I don't know which came first that this one I thought turned out pretty well and then I did a uh, what if Conan was trapped in the 20th century yeah part two and uh, that one I got to ink myself it was the first time I'd inked my own work for for Marvel in a in an interior uh -huh. and I thought that that looked really good yeah <laughs> and you one. felt like it probably looked more like you as well right yeah, I eventually realized that my problem with inkers was that I'm a person that likes to draw when I ink. And so the 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 pencil drawings I do just aren't quite complete. And yeah. when I ink when I ink my own pencils, I change things a lot. Yeah. That's uh, interesting because I was gonna ask about there was a Thor issue. Or you've done you did some Thor issues and you had a range of inkers. You had Coletta on one hand, you had Joe Sinnott on another hand. Um, and actually that's interesting that you're saying that, did you have a favorite inker of those guys? Did you feel like, Ooh, that doesn't look good on me. Ooh, that looks pretty good on me. Or would you rather just ink your stuff? Well, you, it depends on whether you're asking what I felt at the time or, or what I feel when I look back at it. Yeah, sure. Like the, uh, Coletta was Coletta and he always I think he got kind of a bum rap a bit because he he would leave out stuff you'd put in a lot of detail he was famous for leaving it out right and um that's not good but people that John, John, uh, Vinny, uh, Gene Coland also, people from, you started in the 60s with Marvel, the rates were so damn low that you made money by- uh, Cutting corners. Yeah, it was a really a buy the pound business. I mean, you had to turn out a lot of work to support your family. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, and uh, if you could find ways to do that. And for some people like Vinny, it was leaving stuff out. Uh, Gene would sometimes uh, the pencils wouldn't feel quite complete, although they always looked gorgeous when they came in. Mm -hmm. But, but sometimes it, it was just clear he was he was he was rushing a panel here and there. And Busama learned to do it by doing uh, uh, the breakdowns, and sometimes not doing his best work. He would he would he, he had something had to inspire him, or he would he was kind of a. He, John, as brilliant as he was, could be kind of a hack. And so now I look back at Vinny's stuff and say, hey, that's kind of fun. You know, <laughs> my stuff looks like Vince Coletta. Hey, that's that's not so, 
at the time, I think I was like, why did I put all that time into it? Yeah, um, at the time, right. But looking but, back, it's kind of cool because he inked Kirby on Thor and he inked you on Thor. That's kind of cool. You, oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, um, I don't remember everybody else. I remember uh, uh, the Suniga ink, inking me once on Thor. And that was a little later, and I thought, boy, that one turned out really well. It was it was sort of a collage of of, of Thor's career. And, oh yeah. Uh, and uh, I that was I had a lot of fun with that one. And and again, my draft my draftsmanship was getting a lot better. And yeah. and it towards showed. the mid mid to later eighties, you feel like you're coming into your own at that point. Yeah, and uh, um, there was some. I know I know some Thor that. Uh, Maybe it was just covers that Joe inked something, and I always liked. I've always liked what Joe did. Uh, Rubenstein did over me. Right. He was. He would be. He would be one of my favorite inkers. I think again, he always made. Oh, that's cool. And he inked the uh, like well, almost the whole Marvel Universe books too. So yeah, um, yeah. he knew he knows how to ink for sure. And no. uh, then, and another oh thing, God, I have, you about... seen, have you seen what have you seen what he's doing lately with watercolors? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's an artist oh, for sure. Oh my yeah. God. He's just like a brilliant portrait artist. Yeah. He is. Yeah. An illustrator for sure. Um, and another thing I actually kind of like personally as a kid reading West Coast Avengers that you did off a newsstand at 7-Eleven, by the way. So it was like the real comic reading experience, but also I was also reading Mark Grunewald's Hawkeye miniseries. And I felt like there was some, there was a cool, um, integrated feeling of those two limited series that came out around the same time. Uh, so for me as a reader, I loved it. I, I don't remember if Mark was the editor of West Coast Avengers of West Coast Avengers, but I know he and he and Roger worked Closely. well together. Story and so that was, it was the same character. I liked that too, that he was, that was who Hawkeye was. Yeah, Clint Barton for sure. And then, um, and then speaking of Grunwald, obviously you guys then worked on Squadron Supreme together, uh, which I love. Uh, that first issue uh, just starts out with a bang where you see what well, Hyperion in space and there's stuff falling to Earth, and the the angles. I mean, it felt cinematic. That that mm -hmm. that was a real treat uh, seeing your, especially your issues on it. Um, tell us a. Oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about um, like getting that script and going through Squadron Supreme and some of the talks with Mark Grunewald and working with Mark Grunewald in general. Um, again, it's been a long time and I, I remember liking Mark a lot. And I remember we talked about it and I don't remember much. Yeah. I know it, it, he, he had it in mind and the script was pretty well complete and uh but he was very uh open to me um i think it was the first time that i made i made some suggestions and back and forth about about the art and we 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 liked i said okay you know i remember that i was saying okay i want i want uh the uh tom thumb's laboratory to be just a mess and not look anything like a Dr. Doom laboratory, that there's a lot of cords hanging around and that uh, the, the, the screens, have just, they've just been through hell with stuff. So things are held together with tape and stuff like that. <laughs> and, 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 and had a lot of fun with it in that way. I had more fun with that book. And that was the, there were two things uh, about it that I was, and I loved, both of my inkers on that book were good, but, but I thought, um, uh, what's his name? John was it? Was it Beatty who who did mm -hmm. the 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 first the first few? And I I thought, wow, that guy's this this is this feels good because he was doing his style over my style, and they and they meshed. Yeah, and, it does. And, You're and, right. Yeah. And it was one of those things where you felt you were interacting. Oh, I see what he's doing. I'm gonna I'm gonna pencil into where where what he's doing with it too. And that that doesn't happen that much. Sometimes you feel like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pencil tighter so that the, can't, the guy can't do yeah. what he's doing. 
And this there was, was actually a synergy on that, you're saying. Yeah. And unfortunately, I always wondered why they took him off. And then it later, more recently, he told me, well, he, he had a deal that he would, whenever they did stuff with Zek, that he would work with Zek. I see. And, yeah, because so he, he was a it. primary Zek uh, collaborator for sure. They did a lot of work together. Yeah. And so he, he, he got the Zek, the, a Zek project hadn't come through. And so he was available for this, but then a Zek project came through. And, and uh, I can't remember, I'm blanking on the guy's name who did it, the next one and the next one, he was fine, but it was, I, I really liked that, that was, uh, really established the way, the look, of, the look of the book with me. And that was, that was great. Uh, then what happened was my slowness got to me eventually at the point where they were putting the, um, the bad guy is in <clears throat> and it got to be a, a book with, um, you know, close to what it, what it was. It was close to 20 characters running around all the time. Yeah. Uh, which, which was not my forte. And I, I could not make the deadlines and continue the quality I was doing with the book. And I, uh, I think at the time I thought about suggesting that I go to breakdown, but I really didn't want to do it with that book. I, I was, I was, Felt I was really doing some some wonderful draftsmanship, but I had to say I can't. I just can't do it. Yeah, and that and that's why you didn't do issue six and seven. And then is that also why you didn't do the last four? Also, uh, yeah. And the uh, the other thing, um, I didn't like the ending. <laughs> Oh, uh, I, okay. I, 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 I also felt I had really felt strongly about where the book was going and felt that I, I don't I'm, I'm believe me, I don't want to speak ill of, of, of Mark because I think he's brilliant, was brilliant and he was a brilliant person in person. He was one of the most fun people. Around. I remember there was once that I forget who it was. It was it was Marvel wanted us to be more corporate and to dress better in the in the office and to be neater and have less debris around. Mark's response to this was to have a platform built for his desk. The desk went on the platform, and I think he and both he and I think it was Mac Macchio was his assistant at the time. They both were raised up and every piece of paper that came in, they watered it up and threw it over their shoulder until uh, after a week and a half or so, they were floating in a sea of paper. <laughs> so when this guy came back and, and opened the door, it was like the office had become everything he feared. And that was the end of that, that notice that we, that Marvel should become more. <laughs> Oh, that's having cool. more corporate work in the in the building. Yeah. So, 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 Mark was brilliant, but I felt that there, there was the one kind of book that I did not like at Marvel and never liked was the kind where you you felt as if we had this character, this character superpower is this, and this person has this kind of weapon, and this has this kind of a weapon. You would have then you would have them match with the heroes and the heroes would have to figure out on the spot how to overcome the, this person. And the, 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 last, the last issues are just filled with that. Um, these three, and I thought somehow the center of the book had gotten shifted and then the last issue, it tried to wind it up into something and it never quite went where. It was one of the books that I really believed in where it was going and it didn't go there. I see. So it was almost yeah. like you'd rather not even do it. I would rather have not done it. That that's and that's, uh, yeah. And, and I felt well. I well, I continued to work at Marvel. I felt that that it was um, really in a, in a funny way. It was my some of my best work and and also kind of a death knell because I think I got, I think I had before been somebody who was taking out would take off time to do theater and I think people just kind of it was. At one time, that was a big advantage because I got to do movie books and stuff. I got to do all kinds of stuff because I was doing short runs on things. And um, somewhere in there, I think the, the whole feel of it of the place changed. Um, and, and, and that 
people were not happy with me for for that part of it. But I, I think if it would have been very different had I said, I'll do it. I not I can't make the breakdown, but, but I'll do it in breakdowns. Uh, but that was the reason that I didn't want to do that. And uh, yeah, later, later, I was, I, uh, years later, I moved back to Lincoln and I used to work in a, a coffee house down here called The Mill uh, at one time. And I would get tired of being in my studio and I would just, they had a, almost a table that I, I would go down and just be doing Shadow Man in that space. And uh, uh, the guy who owned it was a friend and he, he, he would sit there roasting coffee in this big coffee roaster we're reading the New York Times and he walked over one time at the time he said hey God, there's something some guy Marvel died and they're putting his ashes into the ink yeah and I looked at him and I said oh my god it's Mark <laughs> and and he had, he must have known that he was had had a problem because he had, he had made the um, you put that in his will, he, right? Put that in his will that he wanted his ashes put into printer's ink and used to reprint um, Squadron Supreme. And so, you know, a few weeks later, I got my issues of, or probably a couple of months later, I got my issues of Mark's, <laughs> a little bit of Mark. With my, a little bit of Mark in girls. it, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah and, and Marvel, actually, there was some time way before that, that Kiss put their blood in the ink and... So I guess you know there's a rich history there. Well, I yeah, they I suppose they did that. That <laughs> who know, who knows? The witchcraft <laughs> people, the witchcraft people love that stuff. Um, yeah, I know, I know. So um, now, Emperor Doom, you mentioned that earlier, and it's a beautiful book, and you penciled and inked it, 1987. But there was some inking assist by Keith Williams. What was the story behind that? He did my, he did my backgrounds. Okay, so it was more inking backgrounds, actually. Yeah, yeah. I wish they had put backgrounds in. Uh, that way, it's more specific. Yeah. Yeah, but no, I inked everything. Oh, and, that's and, cool. All the characters yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and I love it because it's almost like another West Coast Avengers story too. I mean, for me as a West Coast Avengers fan, I love I love that book. Yeah, it was a chance for me to do the West Coast Avengers and and plus, you know, I was able to uh, even give them a little bit more character and. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I loved I loved doing that book. Uh, although it was pointed out to me by somebody, uh, can't remember who, but they said the the most powerful thing that's ever happened in the Marvel universe is where Iron Man manages to seal up the hole in in, in Doom's uh, underground thing where this where the sea is pouring in, because it would be like impossible to do. So I and I said, well. It wasn't really in the middle of the ocean. It was in the middle of a of, of stiller water or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, maybe there's a plausibility there, sure. Um, and then uh, tell us about kind of the last, you know, this shift between Jim Shooter to Tom DeFalco. You know, uh, did you notice anything going on that would suggest that there would be a changing of the bar, uh, of the guard at Marvel at that time? Uh uh, yeah, I kind of think that uh, um, you kind of knew something was going on. Uh, uh, there were people who were more uh, intimate uh, with the um, with what was going on than than um, others. Uh, I almost date something. Jim going, Jim being interested in a different direction. Jim interested in, of course, wanting to buy Marvel at one time, mm -hmm. uh, and from the new universe, that it was clear that Jim wanted to remake a universe in a different way. Right, and. Somewhere around there, I thought, you know, it, I remember kind of thinking, you know, Jim's Jim wants his own company. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I no, I think he was. It took him getting fired at Marvel to get him to do that. But but uh, so maybe it was a good thing. But um, 
uh, but it was certainly different. And I think Jim, Jim was, Jim was Jim. I mean, he was a strong, strong personality. And I think sooner or later, some, something was going to clash. Uh, I always liked Jim uh, a lot. And uh, disagreed with him also. You know, I, I think there were, there were things about stuff he did that, that there would always be something that people, somebody, somebody would not be happy with something that Jim did. But, but uh, overall, I think he made Marvel into, he took Marvel when it needed to be made into a company and made it into a company, made it into a business. And uh, you can say that Jim uh, disagreed with the way Jim changed the look of the comics, but as we, we both said, I think it needed that stability of, of the sense that, that kids had to understand what was going on and I thought, thought was very good. And at the same time, some very experimental uh, people like Sinkevich and Miller got their big shot under Jim. So that's right. Uh, he he was when he saw when he saw a genius at work, he he worked with it, um, right, and 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 gave it some room. So I think he did a good job, and I I think it's just one of those things that happens. You know, I mean, he had a long thing at a company and the changing of the guard of the company, and uh, uh, I know that there were various things that. Went on and Jim told me about it, has told me about it. And I don't remember all the details because it was details that were very important to him that are not very important to me. Yeah, the corporate uh, the stuff, good, right. I remember it being a good story. We hadn't seen each other for years and we got together at uh, Louisville. And uh, I thought, gee, because it was after all these stuff about the slap kept coming up. And I said, I hope Jim will come out and we'll have a drink and we'll just talk about, it. you know, I'd like to get that. Just see if does he is he really pissed at me or something? And we we ended up closing a bar uh, in, in Louisville and having a, a really a lovely time. And uh, uh, I've always in, enjoyed Jim. Jim Jim was on the board of a directors of a little small theater after he left Marvel, and while he was in the process of starting Valiant, uh, I did a had a little theater company in New York called the New Rude Mechanicals, and Jim was on the board of it. And oh, so cool. I kept, I kept in touch with him. Jim was on the board and Stan, Stan was sort of on the board. Uh, I had, uh, we were trying to form a board and I, I wrote to Stan who was mainly out in LA and said, would you be on the board? And he wrote back and said, I, I no, I, I would never be able to come to a meeting. And I wrote back and said, Stan, I don't care if you ever come to me. I just want to be the only theater in New York that has Stan Lee on the board. Yeah, I just put his and name so on it. Yeah. So, he, so he, wrote, he wrote us this wonderful letter back saying, as long as you promise never to stage any adaptations of DC comics or any porn, I will be on your board. There you go. And I don't have to come to a meeting. I'll, I'll, I'll be on your board. <laughs> yeah. So we, we published that boundaries. in our first program. He yeah. made his boundaries well known. Yeah. Um, so then uh, now DeFalco, um, how was he at, and actually a quick thing, Carl Potts mentioned that behaviorally something, there was a flip that went off or something switched in shooter during his, run had you encountered anything like that or was he pretty much even keel with you the whole time uh i did not work closely with jim uh i i got to know jim um uh, enjoyed him but i didn't work with him right uh after after the Avengers and, and after I, uh, I know I think it was after the Avengers and I didn't work with him very much. I think the last thing that, that we kind of had input on was the uh, um, Emperor Doom book uh, because I remember he called me at the office and did what I, I called the cosmic eraser speech uh, and one of one of Jim's um, things that he was always getting trying to get right was what would happen if somebody had a cosmic cube or he would he would say this eraser supposing you could take this eraser and it would give out something that that everybody on Earth would listen to what I would say 
No, maybe maybe this was the editor in chief's fantasy yeah. of any editor in chief, yeah. but it was also uh, got got Jim would massage that story and assign it to people. I think because I ended up, he, he, I think he had forgotten that I already had already drawn it twice, once in in the um, supervillain when when supervillain team up met uh, the. Uh, I'm, I've what? been talking too long. The first book, the first book that I did for Marvel was the yeah, what the, like the serial team what with Red Skull and uh, and Doctor Doom champions. You're saying the champions? Yes. When yes. when when thank you when 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 the superhero team make the champions and they, they those two those two things came together, and it was about Doctor Doom having this gas that made everybody obey him and it was really squadron supreme done i mean i mean uh emperor doom done uh, Again. well the first time yeah and, and jim right. may have done before but this was the first time and then i did something with the cube with moon dragon having that same power in the avengers that was one of the the first right. adventure things that i did basically the same idea and then we did it one more time with him for Doom. Right. And I think Jim had been talking to Michelini about it and, and we did it. And I thought it was, you know, probably the most, the more successful version of, of the, of, of the attempts. And so I remember Jim bringing me in the office and talking to me about that. And I, I never, I thought I want to work with Michelini and I, I'm going to insist on inking it myself because it's not out of continuity. And I'm just not going to tell him that I've done this story for him twice before. Uh, and maybe, maybe he knew. Maybe he thought, well, you'll, you'll be able to get it right this time. Yeah. So, uh, so that was it. Was a good experience. It was, yeah. That, that, was that, last, that, that was the last Marvel interaction that I remember having with Jim. With Jim. Yeah. Which, yeah. Because speaking he... of that, Alex, I just want to do a yeah. timeline question. Um, at at some point, um, Dr. Miller of, of uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, theater department invites you back to return as the um, artistic uh, repertory theater um, in charge of that, and you did that for six years. Is that and and there's a blank spot there. Is is that coming in around 1988, 89? I mean, when when is that happening? 87. 87. The first the first the first year was 87. And um, which is when Shooter leaves. So that's that's what I thought. That's right. that's the right mm -hmm. timeline. Yeah. So you're gone from comics for a while. Uh, mm, no, I, I I'm I'm doing fewer comics because Jim was very conscious about giving me work. That was maybe my big interaction with with Shooter, and no matter what anybody else says about him at that time, Jim kept kept me working, and he. Um, uh, would remind me occasionally that I should get a raise. Yeah. Uh, and after, after Jim left, I don't think I had the same deference. Uh, yeah. There, there was, there was not, but I didn't have somebody that was kind of like doing that for me. I had to try to scrounge the work a little bit and go get in the office and wander around and see who had something. And I never had an, and never had a project as, um, that I liked as well as Emperor Doom really ever again. Uh, I had, but I had a number of things that I did and uh, uh, some of what, what, some of my favorite stuff, I don't know whatever happened to it. I don't know if Marvel still has it, but it was, uh, they were doing a Nightmare on Elm Street comic. Mm. And I did a couple of those and then they never got printed. They, they somebody said, uh, you're, we can't do a comic about a, a child molester <laughs> and, and, and they dropped it. And I did, I did a, um, under Tom, I did a, I did one of the last Howard the Ducks and that never got printed. I see. And uh, then I did um, the, <laughs> one of the, one of the probably worst things I did for Marvel was uh, the, um, adaptation of the Captain America movie was about that time. I was going to ask you about that. What what Captain America, are you talking about the um, the really bad one? The Salinger one. 
Yeah, the yeah. Salinger. Salinger. And I did it because uh, Stan was supposedly going to write it. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll get a chance to work with Stan. And Stan looked at the script because we were going to work from the script. And, and he looked at, at some of the photos from it. And I don't think we ever saw a print of the movie, but we, we saw photos from it. And Stan essentially said, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they had, so I did ended up doing the adaptation and uh, just really from the script as if it were a uh, scenario. And then Stan wrote the dialogue. There you go. So, so in essence, I got to work with Stan, but boy, was it a, it, it was bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I did read it when it came out. I like, I liked it, yeah. Uh, yeah. but I mean, I was, you know, eleven. But yeah. Um, so uh, then, also another thing. I, so it sounds like the main difference going toward Defalco was that just you weren't having as much deference or someone uh, keeping you uh, occupied with work. It was actually less stuff of yours was being printed, and you were being called less. Things like that. That that's the main. That's the main difference. It sounds like. Yeah, and I was working in the theater, and I didn't. Uh, that was when I. That was when I would have the had the uh, small theater in New York, and I was trying to get that started. <clears throat> I had determined that I was going to try to pursue that theater career. I see. And part of the part of that was I was doing in the summers. The 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 thing in Lincoln was a summer thing, but the pay was good, and I was enjoying it. And uh, uh, I'm really a very good stage director. Yeah, and I enjoyed being able to to do that, and and also because of the nature of it, I got to hire people, and uh, so I would direct usually one show a season or sometimes two, and then I could bring in other people that I knew and bring in New York actors and inter integrate them with sometimes mm -hmm. with students and with some remarkably talented local people, and I <clears throat> I was enjoying that mm -hmm. the um, and that. <clears throat> But I, but I continued to do the work for Marvel, occasional work for Marvel. It wasn't as steady, but that was okay. And I continued doing work right up through, uh, I had one disastrous ending with Marvel. And it was when, again, I'm blanking, the, the guy that followed uh, DeFalco Oh, Bob Harris. Bob Harris. Uh, I, I've never talked to Bob about it, but um, uh, Bob was not yet. It was this was still under DeFalco, and um, Bob was doing a. There had just been a mini series about um, um, I'm trying to think. I, I can't. I, I really have talked too long. I'm beginning to run out of steam here. The um, uh, <clears throat> Nick Fury, yeah, the Nick Fury series, and uh, and uh, that had been quite successful. I think was I think it was Zach did it, but but they, so they decided they wanted a monthly, and they asked me to do it, and um, I was i can't remember what i was doing at the time whether it was another comics project or a theater project but i said i have time to do it but only if there's a script waiting for me as soon as i've turned in the last one the next script has to be there because i have i've got other stuff on my plate and i can do it as long as we keep we keep rolling with it and i did the first one and it was good. It was Harris was writing it, and went in and said, "Where's the script?" And uh, what, there was no script. And I said, "Okay, well, can I kind of get it in a couple of days?" And I said, "Yeah." I'm, and I'm purposely blanking on who the editor was. I just don't want to mention don't want to say, yeah. And uh, came back in a couple of days, no script, and. A week went by and a week and a half went by and close to two weeks went by and I had to say, look, I, you'll have to get somebody else. I, I can't do this. I told you I 
I now I now would never be able to get it in on time. And then Harris speak, and I don't think, in retrospect, I'm guessing that Harris was never told that that was the deal. And because I can't imagine him not endeavoring to get the script. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about it well, and I didn't, you know, and I also, he always works through an editor. You weren't going to call somebody up and say, you know, what's, what's going on. Uh, but then he became editor and then I never worked for Marvel again. Ah, interesting. So that was a, uh, now, um, so now we're going to kind of uh, just kind of go through the, the later years and we're, and I, I can tell we'll you. We'll move faster. Yeah, we'll move faster for you. I'll try uh, to talk less. Uh, yeah, no, you're great. No, um, you're great. But uh, okay, so then now you, in 1991, then you left Marvel kind of pretty much to then go to Valiant with Jim Shooter and Bob Layton. You worked on Shadow Man, which you actually did some plotting, uh, then also writing and penciling. Uh, Don Perlin would ink you. Tell us about um, how did you hear about Valiant? How'd you how'd you then start working for Valiant and Jim Shooter again? Well, Jim, Jim, as I said, Jim was on my board of directors and he was starting Valiant at the time. And I did some work from Valiant during that um, time, some early stuff of uh, uh, just posters of wrestlers because they were had all this doing the wrestling right. stuff yeah all this kind of work going on for a while and i was i was going to do a, a zelda book for them but they they uh, abandoned the zelda thing before i could really do it and that's just as well uh and um then it became clear the the theater job I had in Nebraska, and by this time I had, I was going through a divorce. Uh, I decided to just move out to Nebraska for a while. I really wanted to get away from New York. Um, and then I found that the job in Nebraska was not going to uh, continue probably because it was tied to the chairman of the department. And the Dean of the college said, when, whenever, this guy, Tice Miller, leaves that post. I'll have to offer what you're doing to the next chairman. And I said, well, we're now at the place where we would have to develop a five-year plan to, if this was going to go anywhere. So this is I'm just going to make this my last year then. And I thought, OK, well, what am I going to do? And I called up Jim. And he said, uh, we don't need more artists right now. We need writers. He said, we, we'll, we'll work with you as an artist too, but for, for right now, what we need is artists. And he said, I'll give you a choice of uh, four or five different books that he mentioned that he was juggling around with who would write what and, and the rest of it. And I did, uh, I picked uh, Shadow Man was one of them and I, looked, I read all of them and Shadow Man seemed to me to be a failed book. Hmm. It was, uh, it had been, um, there had been five issues and um, there had been, I think maybe three different artists and, or three different writers and two different artists or, or something like that, but it was just changing all the time. And it was not clear who the character was or what was happening or it, but it just was clear that it was not um, going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if I, I'll take that one. And if I, if I fail with it too, I'm in good company. And if I succeed with it, I'll look pretty good. Yeah. And, and besides which it was tucked away in a, in a corner of the universe. And I thought, well, it's not going to be as much crossover with this guy and it's, it's new Orleans. And if, I, if it does work, I'll have to go to new Orleans. So I thought that all of these things are good things. So I did take it over and took it over with issue kind of with issue six, which, which was kind of fun. Steve Ditko had drawn it. Mm -hmm. And I got to I got to write the dialogue for it. Uh, I think I may be listed as a co-writer, but really it had all been it had all been plotted. I just wrote the dialogue. Did, and did, you, started, did you meet Steve Ditko at all? I don't think anybody met Steve Ditko at that point. It, it was, <laughs> okay. um, the uh, so I I I think uh, I uh, there were two I think maybe two or three issues that. Uh, 
I wrote with other people drawing it and then I took over drawing it as well mm -hmm. and uh, drew it through, basically did that, wrote it and drew it through issue 43. And uh, so it was a long run and the book, the book did well. Yeah, you brought it what, back. What, yeah, it wasn't a giant hit, but it was always in the top 100. And uh, uh, and I felt I was doing good work. Um, was inked by John Dixon and then by Tom Ryder. Um, uh, the uh, thing with it was that by the time I had done the first story arc, and I was nervous about it. I thought, yeah, okay, no, I've not written a, a, a real arc stories for comics before. I'd written plays mainly, and not, I had not done a lot of comic book writing. The closest I came was, you know, doing some rewrites when I was an editor. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to have to show this to Shooter, and we'll see what he thinks of it. And by the time I finished it, he was gone. Right. He'd been forced out of the company. And so I was working with Bob Layton, and Layton pretty much left me alone. And Don Perlin was my editor. And Don, uh, Don was a good editor. Uh, he, he would, sometimes he didn't know exactly what it was that I was doing. <laughs> and because I, I was able to go off into some odd directions, but he had a lot of faith and he uh, went with me on it. And, and, and the feedback I got from him was always good. And um, uh I just had a, a wonderful time doing it and uh, uh, probably as much pleasure doing that. And the next thing I did, which was um, Armed and Dangerous, which I created from scratch, uh, as anything I've done in comics, because there's something very heady about writing and drawing your own stuff. And uh, so that was, that was probably the best time I ever had. And we were all making a lot of money and it was the oh, 90s. Cool. And, yeah. Alex, and, can, I, can I pick yeah, that yeah, up sure. with... Arms, armed and dangerous. Yeah, okay. and, and, and just one quick thing. Did you enjoy drawing what you wrote? Oh, oh my God, yes. Because it was, uh, you know, you you were interacting with yourself. You know, you would get an idea, and I usually use the Marvel method. I I would I would do a scenario, and I would uh, uh, draw it. And as soon as I drew a panel, I knew what they were saying in the panel. It, you know, so it was, uh, uh, it, it was, it was, it was a good, it was a good, good experience. Mm. And it worked right up until um, when a claim took Valiant over, they were, it was the, the, the hand, handwriting of doom was on the wall. It was, for one thing, the sales were slowly going down at that point. They were starting, it was starting, the collector's market was starting to, um, that collector's market was just insane. And it really was beginning to deteriorate. And I, I, I never understood collector's markets, but you know, they, they almost always, from the first one in history, the big tulip market that burst back in the 17th century, uh, they always, they, those bubbles always burst. And so you, uh, if you're smart, you, you didn't buy a Porsche, you saved your money and, uh, in my case, my indulgence was I went and lived in uh, Europe for a while, for a couple of years in, in England and Ireland. Uh, but I was still working at the time, so it was like a, it worked out very well. Uh, but we got to the uh, point of uh, claim taking over, and the claim was very insistent that what they, the guy, the head of the company came in and said, what we want is you to create icons that we can make into games. And apparently I was the person that, opened his big mouth and said, well, if that's all we're doing, the company's got to go under. We better tell good stories too. And um, I don't remember, I don't remember that except, but, but several people from Valiant have said, don't you remember you saying that? I said, no, <laughs> not really, but, but it was true. It was true. And, and, and the, the, if, if one thing Valiant had was pretty good storytelling and it, it kind of went slowly went downhill because there's a lot of stories that were still in the, they were underway and stuff. 
And then it was a certain point where I got called in and said, you've been doing Shadow Man wrong. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, well, he's, he's a black guy. And I said, well, he's a Creole. He's always been a Creole. You know, that's, that's a very specific kind of culture and that's where he's always been. That's what I've always drawn. And was quite insistent that he was a black guy. And there certainly were enough African-Americans in the strip, you know, it wasn't, there was a risk to that. It's just, that wasn't who the, this particular character was. And I, well, what's going on? And then I realized, value, a claim has done the demographics and decided that if they make Shadow Man into a game, it will work better with the black protagonist. And so I said, look, uh, this is a different character. Why don't I do something else? And, because uh, first of all, I was under contract. I'll do something else and relaunch it, relaunch, reboot the character with, with whatever the claim wants. And that was, everybody was agreeable to that. And I had the chance to almost kill off my character. I left him in issue 43 halfway. He jumped off a building because he was supposed to have died in the year 2000. And uh, I thought anybody that was stuck with that as a prediction would be having a nervous breakdown. When, well, what happens? What's happened if I try to commit suicide before 2000? What? I can't. And so I gave him a nervous breakdown and had him jump off a building and left him halfway down and said, okay, if they want to, <laughs> if they want to, if they want him to live, I know how he can do that. If they want him to die, here's their chance. And um, as soon as I can tell, he's still halfway down the building. So I went on to, and I went on to do Squad and Supreme. So that's the story of that one. So you were talking about uh, going to England and then Ireland. You were living in, in Cornwall uh, for a while. When you were working at Valiant at that point, or mm -hmm. you would, okay. Um, and how, how many years or how long were you uh, over there? Um, about two and a half years. Until things really, until sh the, the, the shit really helped hit the fan with uh, the comics industry. Um, Valiant was, well, first of all, that's where I was when I found out I was adopted. So I did want to come back to Lincoln. That's why I'm in Lincoln now is I said, okay, I want to move back to Lincoln for a while and try to um, find out something about that. And uh, also, uh, it just was clear that, that, that maybe it came clear eventually that the claim was going to go under. The, you could just see the print runs were getting, I was doing Armed and Dangerous, print ones were getting less and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and uh, I think the, the last, issue of that was published of Armed and Dangerous. I had to find it on the newsstand and buy a copy. They weren't even sending out copies to the artists anymore. Um, and were you and, in England? Were you in England at that point? Yeah, I was okay. living in York, in York at that at York, England at that point. And uh, um, so I said, well, I've got to I got I got to be back in the States and uh, you know I, my my I make, I'm still was making pretty good money. My page rate was what was on my contract. And so I was still producing uh, <clears throat> the comic and it was the royalties that were, were going to hell, but it was still, it was still fine. And I'd saved a bunch of money, but I, uh, so you came back home and uh, actually had one more arc of Armed and Dangerous that I was doing. Uh, and it was a four issue thing. and. Uh, at that time, uh, Fabian was the, had taken over as editor and he uh, called me and said, produce these pages as fast as humanly possible and uh, we'll try to pay you for anything we get, we get done. And I, so I got three issues that I knew would never be published. Yeah. And, th but that they paid me for. And uh, I thought I would never see those again, but actually got returned. They got returned to me about three years, four, 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 four years ago. Where, uh, before we talk about Armed and Dangerous, where um, uh, where did you live in Ireland? Just curious. <coughs> Dublin. Oh, okay. I love Dublin. Yeah, I loved it too. It was, it was great. You Had a stout a, drinker? Uh, yeah, I drank entirely too much Guinness. And uh, actually, my my drug of choice was Bushmills, Bushmills oh. Black. Uh, uh, 
And uh, yeah, well, I came back weighing considerably more than I do now <laughs> <laughs> after all the stout, but uh, so it was, yeah. Let's talk about Armed and Dangerous. Uh, that's my favorite thing that, that you've done. I, I think that's uh, Me too. that's really, really good work. Um, amongst other things I like, but that one, that's special. Um, what was it like? Because you're doing that at the time that Miller is is doing, has done Sin City, um, uh, Straight Bullets is out. There's there's some black and white stuff going on that's that's uh, that's really nice. Was it intimidating to, to jump into that? I think when I first, it was, it was, Bob Layton suggested that I do, that, that that should be what I do as the alternative to, to, to Shadow Man was a crime thing of some kind. And I, I knew what they were looking for was, um, nobody was saying you have to do imitation uh, Miller, but I knew that it was in their heads. And it was also in mine, and I had to get it out of my head before I could do it. And um, Bob was very helpful. I was I did a, a little uh, long one act play at that point in New York. I was living back in New York at that point, and um, I did a. Bob came to see it, but he all but I also did, and I did I did a poster for it, and the poster was nothing like what my comic book work had been like. And he said, "Can can you do that?" style for the book and I said well I can I can play with it because I've done a lot of black and white poster work and stuff like that and I said yeah I can do I, it won't be exactly like that but I'll come up with something and that freed me a little bit from the Miller thing but but the really freeing thing I think if you if you start with a story and don't feel it has to look a certain way but you you let the story determine the book, the look of what you're doing, which I think was a little bit what I had done to discover that it was Shadow Man. And because I was with Shadow Man, I was at least freed from the thing of everybody has to look like, yeah, I want to do my own thing, but it has to look like Marvel, you know, from Marvel. And, and so there was more freedom with Shadow Man and with, with Armed and Dangerous. And so Armed and Dangerous, I just started trying to work from stories that I knew or had heard for most of the details in the book. The, the overall plots were, were mine, but the details were all based in something. And so they had a life of their own already. And I think that's why the book worked so that uh, the first issue was when I, when I, um, Early on when I moved to New York, uh, we had just moved into the second place we lived, which was on West 81st Street. And it wasn't a great neighborhood at the time. It's really a lovely neighborhood now, but it was it was a kind of a rough neighborhood. Um, a lot of the Upper West Side was in the early 70s. And it um, wasn't that far from Needle Park down on 72nd Street, which is known because of you know, a lot of drugs a lot of drugs uh, around the neighborhood and dealing. And uh, there was a laundromat um, a block away that occasionally we went to. And one day I was walking past the newsstand and looked at the New York Post and it said something about a severed head being found in a dryer in a laundromat. I looked and it was that laundromat and I kept that story in my head for years. And for a while I read the New York Post because I wanted to find out what happened to that. And it's the only story I ever heard about. It. I never heard about why the story, but there were, they caught anybody or stuff. So I said, well, the first story that I do for Armed and Dangerous is gonna tell the story of how that head got into that, that dryer. And I just went from there. And the, the, the plot I'd had was a kid who didn't know his folks were in the mob, had been kept somewhere upstate in a boys school and it had been kept from him and now all of a sudden there had been deaths in the family and he he was going to have to come down and find him found himself in this in this milieu so um he was called upon to be part of this 
severing of the head that, that his uncle is, is one of the um, guys working for the mob and he gets involved in it. And uh, at the same time, just a lot of little smaller details were things that I, I had run into in New York or even things that happened, happened to me when I was in school, when I was this kid's age and I could use them, you know, I transferred them to New York and use them. And that gave, I think, the, 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 the thing a life and made it other than uh, a Frank Miller uh, ripoff. Uh, and so I, mean, I was very satisfied with that. I, I would suggest to anybody that that's, that's the way to work is to, uh, you know, take stuff that you know and it will all of a sudden have a different identity. Um, and, and there was, later on, there was another story that I thought was just, somebody told me this story and I said, oh my God, that's a whole issue of, uh, that, that it really happened, that there was a drug bust just outside Lincoln. And somebody from Lincoln, I was living in New York and they had sent me the, this article that the um, uh, Nebraska Highway Patrol had uh, stopped a car coming across the Interstate 80, coming across country on its way to New York and found that it was a car full of cocaine. And uh, so the, the FBI got involved and there was a dispute between the Highway Patrol and the FBI as to who had no jurisdiction. But of course the FBI said, no, they crossed the state line, it's ours. And they were resistant and they said, look, okay, we won't object, but the guys who made the bust on the highway, we get to go to New York and watch the FBI in action. And so they had, they had you know, the guys in the, in the car had talked and said where they were supposed to leave the car. And so that's great. It was their story. You know, I had the, the here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the car sitting at a spot in New York. And I have all of my characters sitting in, in one, one pizza place across the street, keeping an eye on it. They're not going to get it. They're not going to go to that car until they're sure it's safe. And in and, and this restaurant on the other side are the FBI and the, and, and the guys from Nebraska watching it too, waiting for the, for the crooks to come. And, and this is the part of the story that was wonderful. It was true. It was parked in a no, a no parking zone. And the New York tow came and started to tow it away. And the FBI came running out and, and, and said, you can't, you, can't, you can't tow this car, we're FBI. And the tow truck guys said, to hell with you, we're New York tow. <laughs> <laughs> and they and they they got it they got into a fight and the, and the FBI is trying to arrest the tow truck guys and the the the, the one of the, so there's a guy outside the tow truck and there's a guy inside the tow truck and the guy inside the tow truck calls in an SOS and more tow trucks show up and block the street oh that's great that's and, fantastic and, and, and so my guys are sitting, my guys are sitting over in the restaurant saying I think we're going to let this one pass <laughs> Uh, and, and it was just, it was just, you know, you can't, you can't think up stuff like that. You can build on it, but, but it's just, it, it was, it was a gift. It was a gift that just all, all the stuff that had happened when I was in New York just could be, could be there. So is it, would you say Armed and Dangerous was a book that you would have, that's unfinished, that you would have liked to have kept doing, that you were having fun with it? Oh yeah, well, like I said, I kept doing it, and there's a there's an unpublished one, but I don't I don't I, I don't even, we don't even know who owns the rights to it. Uh, Armed and dangerous. So supposedly, supposedly, Valiant bought it maybe on mass, and you and you can't really ask. You know, it's like, um, oh, I can't think of the guy's name. He runs. He's the CEO of uh, IDW. Goldstein. Yeah. Is that right, Alex? Yes. Yep. And I think it was, yeah, I think it's Goldstein. And he called me up uh, a few years ago and said, I was working as uh, an assistant at uh, a claim back when they went under. And they gave me a whole bunch of pages to put in a cardboard box and keep in my garage. Oh, that's how you got it back. And he said, I've been going through it and I, and he said, and this stuff is great. Do you, do you own the rights to it? And I had to say, no, no, I was under contract. Valiant owns the rights. And I, I spent a little time trying to find out. I called uh, 
emailed Fred, who just avoided the issue of, you know, did they buy that when they bought? Uh, but of course, you know, why would they, why would they not say that they that they own it? You know, it's easier for them to say they own it. And, you know, I would have to prove they didn't own it. And it's it's so anyway. But yes, I I loved it. I would I would I would have kept doing it forever. That seems like like a. a a work of yours that that other fans that weren't necessarily following your your Marvel stuff or your peers, some of the artists that you that you know that you knew would come up to you and just say, "Yeah, I really like that." That's 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 obviously um, yeah. There aren't, a different there aren't level. yeah. There aren't thousands of them, but when they do, they really it's, it, it's memorable. They really remember that book. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm one of those guys. I like that an awful lot. Uh, do you think it helped you when you moved? Because after this um, value goes or acclaim goes away, you go uh, and you work, um, you do a little bit of work at Marvel, but you go and do a second round at DC doing Batman and stuff. Do you think that the, that the, the grittiness, the urban aspect of, of, um, of, of that, of Armed and Dangerous and getting away from Marvel um, help you understand or do anything differently in terms of Batman and the Joker stuff? Oh, I think so. Although I'm not sure it was for my own good. It, it was, it was in Denny's, Denny O'Neill's last days there. Uh, he was going to retire soon. And um, he liked my ideas and what I did. And the best thing I did was uh, a, an Elseworlds thing called I Joker. Right. And, and, and I love that because it sort of anticipated the Hunger Games by, <laughs> uh, but, you know, by, by any number of years. Uh, and that was, that one was great fun. Um, and then I wanted to do just a typical Batman story from, the, from when I was, the kind of stories that I read when I was and that I remembered them as, as being when I was a kid, although they weren't really like it, but um, with a little bit of the early 70s Batman, which I really loved thrown in, and I did Batman DOA. Um, and I had, I had fun with that one. Uh, I just enjoyed doing it. Um, it was just doing Batman. And uh, then finally, I think, and I think it was my death knell at DC, I did Working with Denny, it, it was the last vestiges of the sane Batman. It was, it was, it was, Batman had not gone really, he was grittier than uh, some, but Denny didn't do a gritty Batman. He did a dark Batman. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, he, and, and it hadn't gotten that point where Batman was psychotic or was he not psychotic or, you know, that, that, that it got to be later on. And, uh, uh, so we were, it was kind of an old style Batman and my, my favorite thing, but I think it was like, just like it's totally out of sync with where DC was going was to do, um, it's Joker time, which had the, the Joker take over a reality TV show. Right. And, and, and because he had been, it, it was my version of network it was all about uh, t TV and and uh, they were trying to cure de cure him in in Arkham's Arkham Asylum by forcing him to watch daytime television constantly, and it eventually uh, made him even more insane than he than he than he had been before. And the Joker ends up winning at the end, <laughs> and I, I and I kind of loved it, but it was all satire, and I think satire is just not, wasn't it wasn't in it. It wasn't yeah. I, 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 I think it just puzzled people <laughs> in DC. So when, when did you see the, uh, the recent Joker movie? And did, yeah. did you think, did you think of that at all when you were uh, thinking back about your stuff? I think they read I Joker. I, or it's Joker time. Yeah. I think they, I think they double swear they did. Because uh, there's a lot of little elements in there that were. Yeah. Um, it's hard to yeah. see it otherwise. That, yeah. that's that struck a chord when i was looking over it because there was like joker child abused as a kid and then mm -hmm. like him yelling at the tv cameras and the and the crowd and i was like mm -hmm. this is from the todd phillips movie um yeah but yeah. by two 20 years 
you know, before it. So yeah, um, yeah. I thought that was interesting. And probably mm -hmm. better than the movie because I, I'm not a fan. Uh, and now, so now we just want to kind of go through quickly some of your uh, more recent uh, projects. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about your drama stuff uh, for a few minutes and we'll be done. Okay. Alex? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, you know, go, go, well, go ahead. You've got, you've got a list yeah. of stuff, I'm sure. You, you, <clears throat> so, you have lists. So as a, um, kind of as we uh, gear toward the end, um, you penciled an issue of Free Mind for Bob Layton and Dick Giordano's Future Comics in 2002, um, and I assume this was because of the Bob Layton connection that you had from Valiant. Is that is that mm -hmm. correct? Sure. Yeah. And uh, and do what was your impression of this future comics endeavor that Giordano and Layton were going for? It it it, it was it, it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. The uh, I. Oh God! No. What, what's the guy? The guy's name that was uh, uh, wrote a brief history of time. Um, Hawkins. Yeah, Stephen, Hawkins. Stephen Hawkins. Yeah. yeah, Stephen Hawkins. Uh, I, I, I felt it was a little in the design of the character was. I, I felt a little creepy about it. It was like really because it was really St Stephen Hawkins uh, as a person who could become a superhero, and it was pretty clear that they were. Um, using that, using his persona, the character looked like Stephen Hawkins, and I, 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 I thought that was, that was a, I thought it was a wonderful idea. I was a little bit just the physicalization of it. I, 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 I felt a little creepy about it, but, but I, I, I didn't think it was a bad idea. It, it, it had it. It seemed kind of like maybe a little bit limited because he, I, I didn't know where, I didn't know where the strip was going, and, and it, uh, it just never. The, the company didn't go anywhere. It was just uh, the wrong timing. Uh, it just wasn't time for a, a new universe to be created. Um, I think it was too close to the the big the cataclysm. Um, and it was, in a funny way, it was old guys trying to do it. You know, None, it wasn't <laughs> that Bob was that old, but it was like. Uh, a time when what had happened was that the um, the new guys had cleaned out the old guy house in in Marvel and DC to a great extent, and you know most of us who were working, the majority of people who were working back then, unless they were had achieved superstar status, uh, weren't getting work, and even some of those weren't. Uh, I don't think Walt got much work for. A, for a while, and uh, um, Byrne continued to work, but it was always, you know, like well, I think he wanted to do independent stuff, but uh, yeah, his own thing. But but I, you know, it was like just people weren't people started getting work again, but it was, uh, you know, just a time. It was it was the wrong timing for for from that aspect. I think I think Bob wanted to do a good a good old fashioned comic book company, and it just wasn't the right moment. Right, and I think I also read that Diamond distribution, and then we're doing some something. There was there something was something didn't work there, for them. There was yeah. something going on there, and I Bob has explained it to me, and I it, it went it kind of went in one ear and out the other. Kind of right, quite right. Sure. And yeah. uh, and then, then a quick question, then Jim will finish up with um, theater projects when. Jim, Jim Shooter, as you say, was forced out of Valiant um, in kind of the mid 90s. And part of it was based on an interview with him that Leighton and uh, Masarski kind of teamed up to get him out. Did you feel any, because you're friends with Shooter and he, he always kind of had a, um, always looked out for you. Did you in any way have any weird feelings toward Leighton during the time of Future Comics or when you worked with him at Valiant because of that? No, no. I, I uh, the, the, the one thing I uh, did when, when, when Jim was fired, uh, I, mean, I mean, we both let go. I mean, he wasn't fired in the same sense as Marvel, but he was forced out of the company or voted out of the company, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, was I, I did call him up and said, well, 
you know, what should I do? I'm working, I'm working there now. Uh, uh, you have to tell me if you, see, you were, you were good enough to hire me. I said, if you're going to tell me, you can't do that. Uh, I, I will probably, you know, go with wherever you come from with it. Uh, and he said, no, no, you, you have to keep working there. Obviously you, you've got work and, and you must go ahead and do it. And I had no ill feelings about, you know, I felt, okay, he's, that's fine. Uh, and um, I, I think I avoided pretty much um, wanting to know the grisly details of, of it. It had nothing to do with me. And Jim had said, what, what I've been gracious about it. And I thought, okay, this is, this is fine. Bob was always decent to me. So that's okay. You know, it was, it was what it was. It was. It was more like that. Yeah. Okay. All right, Jim, let's finish up with theater uh, projects. Well, a couple more uh, comics that he, he's done and then, then we will, but, but uh, I wanted to ask you, Bob, you were going to say something. You had something you wanted to add. What was that about? Was that DC still? Oh no, it was, it, it's well, two things. It's uh, the, the, the one thing that I did that as a, I've done, I've done other comic projects in the meantime, and a lot of them were private um, kind of runs and stuff, but I did do the, um, uh, that one um, part of that one uh, Kiss comic that they did with Platinum. Uh, and they wanted somebody who could, who could hearken them back to the 70s and so I did. Um, I, I actually got to work on on a on a kiss project that you mentioned the bloody and the blood in the in the ink. So I did a little bit of kiss. In fact, I was at San Diego when I uh, what's his name called me um, the guy with the tongue. What's his name? Uh, oh, uh, Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons. Uh, uh, the platinum people called me and said Gene Simmons is here and wants to meet you. Gene Simmons knows who you would know who everybody is because one of the deals with working for Kiss is that Gene buys the, all the art in advance. Yeah. And so, so he owns all the art. And they said he wants, he wants to meet you. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll try. And it was San Diego. And 45 minutes later, I still had not made it to their booth. And Gene Simmons' attention span is not 45 minutes. So, so I, that's why I know I got to meet Gene Simmons. I'm not, that, I'm not really brokenhearted about that. But yeah, right, it, right. It's okay from what I've heard. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and I'm a big Shannon Tweed fan. Jim knows that about me. So Yes. Well, that, will, that, that, that helps. The, uh, uh, no, what I was going to say is what I'm doing now is I'm the work I've been working. I've been doing educational work and have done uh, work from uh, it's usually night on National Science Foundation grants and have done something about the measles called the Carnival, Carnival of, Con of Contagion. That was the thing I was about to ask you about. And so I've done that. Well, let me I'll, I'll, let me fill you in on the rest of it. Uh, this last year, I did one called "Mosquitoes Suck," that will be be published at some point. I'm not quite sure when it's coming out. That's uh, um, uh, through uh, University of Wisconsin, and again, National Science Foundation. And then uh, the woman who's gotten me these jobs, a woman named Judy Diamond, and she got this year a National Science Foundation grant to do, it's called an emergency grant, to do a weekly comic page on the uh, coronavirus for kids and uh, trying to reach them in a slightly different way. And so that's been going on. I just finished the last part of it today. The last, it's our last week this week because we know who, th who knew it would be going on this long. And um, uh, the great part about it is it's the first time I got to do funny animals, which is, is great. And if you want to take a look at it, I you, go, you go to world of, <coughs> www, obviously, worldofviruses.unl.edu. Okay. And uh, I've pretty much done most of the art with it. I, I got an assist uh, in the second one from a couple of, of, of ones with, with Bob Camp, did a couple of them, and uh, been working with a native artist, collaborating with a native artist on the last, the last uh, 
arc of it, but uh, you might you might enjoy it. That's a, a fascinating and rising field um, doing um, med medicine related and health related uh, comics. And I'm seeing more and more of it. And some of it is incredibly well done. I mean, really, really good comics uh, in itself. And I, so I'm very interested in that. Um, so I'll make a point of looking at that. Yeah, take a look. Tell, let me know what you think. <laughs> And I, I will send you a couple of links of some of the things that I've seen that I thought were pretty amazing. Uh, that would be and, cool. Okay, we'll do that. Um, you also did one that's not medical. That it, it, I, I've seen some of it, and it looks just great. Um, the the ghost, the haunted uh, hallways, um, one that you're doing. Um, oh, oh, yes, yes. The um, th that was for the alumni magazine. Uh, they wanted me to do a, it, it was the 100th anniversary, 150th anniversary of the University of Nebraska. And they asked if I would do a uh, comic about the, a series of comic pages in their alum magazine last year um, on the history of the university. And I said, sure, how many pages have we gotten? They said, well, we can give you two to three each each issue for four issues. And I said, I can't do the history of the university in, in that length of time. <laughs> Uh, but why don't I do a history of one building and the theater building, which I know a lot about, is supposed to be haunted. So I said, why don't we do that one and I'll have the theater ghost narrate the history of the of it. And that, that again, it was a lot, a lot of fun, something different. You could tell you were having fun with it, the pages that I saw. That, that's yeah, great. Thanks. thanks. All right. So uh, super quickly, um, you were doing... Um, you were doing, and I'm not sure when, but um, you started teaching comics a little bit, teaching a, um, uh, a history of comics and some other some sequential drawing um, stuff. When was that? Um, I uh, was working for with a college out in uh, central Nebraska, Hastings, Nebraska. They have a nice little college out there and they asked me to come out and do a series on how to draw comics. And so I would go out there. That was called their their. Uh, um, it was a January uh, class. They had a a special series in the month of January, which was between semesters, when you could take a whole class by by somebody would come out and do every day for two weeks. So it was all a concentrated thing, and uh, had had a lot of fun doing it and then did it again for the University of Nebraska and then did it again for Nebraska Wesleyan University. So I've, I've done it several times. Um, don't know if I want to ever do it again, uh, but it, it's, 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 it's quite enjoyable. It's something I sort of have in my back pocket that people have talked about doing something for, with Native Americans because what I try to do is to get kids to tell their story as opposed to uh, Automatically going to, going to do a manga or a superhero story, and saying you know work work with work with that's something I got from doing the Armed and Dangerous is work with you've got a story, you figure out what stories you have to tell, rather than feeling you have to tell other people's stories. Uh, and so did that. Uh, this was all while I was running a Shakespeare festival here. Well, that was going to be my next question. Um, Tell us a little bit about your uh, about that. Is that that's the uh, the Flatwater Shakespeare? Yeah. Uh, when I got back to Lincoln, um, I mean everything was drying up. The the D, it was clear that the DC work was. Um, and I did some other stuff at DC. I did an issue of Chase, by the way, which is a right. That's right. That 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 one just the inking. I mean the guy, uh, one of the people who had. I can't, again, I can't think of the names. I've been to too many names in my life, but he's one of the, just a fantastic artist. And, uh, Williams, and he, right? Is it? Williams, yes, thank yeah. you. And he, and he inked it and it was just beautiful. It was beautiful oh, stuff. Oh, he's a great artist. Um, the, uh, but, but I was back, I wasn't getting any work and I, I had intended to stay here for maybe a year or so and try to see what I could find out, which was nothing about my background. But uh, all of a sudden, the, the cost of living in, in Lincoln looked awfully good. And I, I, I had saved up money during the 90s and I was okay for a while. 
And then the opportunity came to start a Shakespeare festival here and a, a, a small one, but we had a, uh, a facility in a local historic cemetery that had been there since the end of the Civil War. And there was an old stables in that cemetery. And somebody said, you should take a look at this. This could be a Shakespearean theater. And I thought, yeah, really in a cemetery. Okay. Went out and it was perfect. It was, you know, when the, when the plague would hit London, um, Shakespeare's troupe would have to go out and play in inn yards. They would, have to, they would have to leave London and tour around. They would play in inn yards. And his, his stuff works in that way if you don't have the audience at one end and play at the other end if you have the audience all surrounding it. And it was just a beautiful uh, place to do Shakespeare and we, we started doing it and it's, uh, it's still going. And I ran it for 15 years and that was enough. I realized I had done over, over the course of my entire career, I directed Twelfth Night six times and that was probably one time too many and it was time for me to pass it on to somebody. Uh, and you want to you want to pass these things on and see it have a have a life afterwards. But uh, and that's when I started doing the um, educational stuff. It was about the time that I and I went back I went back to school and got an MFA in art. Also, oh, was that at New School? No, that was that was that was that Don Stacy thing I talked oh, about. Okay. This was this was like uh, I turned the year I turned seventy. I started going back to school and. Uh, I've always loved doing uh, paintings that had nothing to do with genre um, stuff. Um, and usually they're on the abstract side. I'll show you one. I've got one behind me here. Um, oh, that's nice. Look and that. it's, and it's, it was something I did when my writing partner, this guy, David Richmond, I told you about passed away. And he was living on our, at that time on our horse farm down in Versailles, Kentucky. And this one is called Mr. Mr. Richmond walking away. Um, but I love doing this kind of this kind of work. And it's just a different, it's just a whole different Daddy. thing for me. Where right. you where, uh, almost right? Yeah, it's it's interesting. That art, um, you could tell you had you have quite an affection for that guy. Yeah, yeah. It's uh um I started doing painting on the side when I was in uh, New York still, when I was attending that studio where I do models. And I always did, I ended up doing mainly abstract work because comics is so much like drawing. Sometimes it gets to be like uh, engraving the Lord's Prayer on the heads of pins, you know, it's like this, this kind of work and doing something where I could just take paint and move it around was so cathartic. And also I didn't, think much about trying to sell any of it. Occasionally I would sell a piece, but to do something that I wasn't trying to make money from was very freeing. Yeah. It freed my it freed my head up a lot because everything you do in comics is to make money. I mean you may really feel something about it, but it's your job. Yeah, it's a commercial and, yeah. art. Absolutely. Yeah. And no, doing I have something two, very two very quick unique. questions uh Shakespeare related. Okay. Um did you ever want did you ever want to do anything, um, any adaptation or anything play with Shakespeare in terms of uh, your art or your comics work? I was going to do, you know, a valiant, one of the last things that Acclaim, Acclaim was, was doing this, they bought the rights to Classics Illustrated. And uh, I was going to do King Lear. Ah. I was going to draw King Lear and uh, still would like to, to do that, there have been a, but there have been so many manga King Lears and manga, you know, uh, various comics adaptations. I think most of, most of them, there have been a lot of them, and most of them have been pretty lousy. Uh, but I would, I would, so I would love to have a crack at that uh, and see if you could do something as elegant as like P. Craig, P. Craig Russell is my idol for that kind of stuff. The stuff that he his adaptations of operas. Have you ever seen any of those? Oh yeah, all of them. Beautiful. Oh, they're just they're just breathtaking, and uh, you know if you could do something that good with Shakespeare, yeah. it would be fun. He's a painter too, so that would work out really well. Yeah. And then my 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 final question on that is, what was your favorite Shakespeare experience as a 
either a performer or as a director or even as simply in attendance at a at a show what was the most meaningful just perfect Shakespeare experience did you have um I can tell you I can tell you two they're not probably the most profound ones but the first one is an actual Shakespearean uh, experience we're watching my my ex-wife and I are Lorraine are and we're still very Close, she and I. Um, my, I am now married to a woman named Paula Ray. That's her last name, Ray. Who's uh, just been? It's, it's been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful relationship. Um, but anyway, Lorraine and I are going to London for the first time. It's that time when the when we went over on the Twenty Laker Express, and we're we're, we're seeing it on a shoestring, and we go in every day to the Royal Shakespeare Company. And say what seats have you got so that we can get the, the the discounted seats, which means that we're seeing all of these plays, but we're seeing them in different parts of the theater the whole time. And for uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One, we're seated in the front row, and uh, Prince Hal and Hotspur are having a duel, and the sword of Hotspur breaks and goes flying in the air above our heads and comes down, falls at Lorraine's feet and bounces up and she catches it in her, in her lap. And we look up and all of the great actors in England are staring at Lorraine for one moment. And then somebody tosses Hotspur a sword and they go on. <laughs> and the only bad part is that, that, that at, 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 inter, at the intermission, um, all of these usher people come running up and saying, are you okay? And she says, yes. And I said, well, then give us back to so <laughs> we thought, we thought we take it home. Later, uh, that's later, like going to a ball game and catching, the, uh, catching a fly. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So many years later, it was at the end of the 80s. By this time, we've done Dracula in England and we're staying in Stratford with a guy named Jack Moore, who became an actor who was, he was in that and he became a friend of ours and he's, he's playing Stratford. So we go over to see him because he says, you can come over and stay with me. And so we're, we're there. And he arranges a reading of, of a, I did an adaptation of Frankenstein that's been done a couple of times. It's never quite been right, but, but they, the Royal Shakespeare Company did a reading of it, which was delightful. And then we go to the, see this play. Now it's not a Shakespeare play, but it's at the Royal Shakespeare Company in their little theater where the audience is sort of surrounding everything. And it was called The Art of Success. And I don't know what there was about that night, but again, it was Lorraine and I sitting watching it. And it was one of the best ex theater experiences I've ever had. There was something just magical about it. The actors were wonderful. The play seemed wonderful. And it was just, something in the air and they came out for a curtain call and the audience kept applauding and they went off and you know any more standing ovations are a dime a dozen everybody stands up for everything because they paid a lot of money and they want to be sure they're getting their money's worth but this was the audience didn't stand up we just sat there and so, I get, I still get emotional thinking about it because it was like, we just kept applauding and we decided as a group, as the audience, that we, we demanded another curtain call and they had already left. And we sat there and we just continued to applaud and we applauded for what must have been like 10 minutes, that which is crazy in the theater, that doesn't happen. And finally the actors came back on and some were crying and some had made, you know, cold cream on their faces and they were in their bathroom and they'd been rounded up and asked to come back oh, and take wow. one more bow. And the next day at breakfast, Jack said to us, what happened? What happened? There's everybody's talking about it. And I said, I don't know. It just was something that I don't know. I probably will never have another experience like that again, where everybody makes this kind of decision that this was this was wonderful and we're not ready to go home yet and come back one more time
And it was great. That, so that's my best theater experience of all time. Well, we're not going to get a better story than that. That's great. So I think we should we should close out. Okay. Uh, well, um, Bob, uh, thank you so much for your generous time. You know, uh, I it's it's actually quite amazing. You're you're really different from the other interviewers in that you're an actor, performer, um, writer, editor, uh, artist, uh, an auteur, and uh, very. It was a real pleasure to learn the different dimensions of your artistic and professional outlets. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks, thanks for doing it. Let me, let me know when it becomes a reality. You're gonna, you're gonna tell me, okay, now we're gonna get this down to 10 minutes. You know? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, we, <laughs> no, we go long. This is, a, this, is a holi- this is a holistic, this is a holistic Bob Hall experience, yes. Okay, great. That's fun. That, this, was, this was a lot of fun. <laughs>